our students, uh, those who are here, I think, I don't know if a few or not, but yeah, the, mine's, not. The mine's not, but Jeff, Meredith, uh, Carrie, Jordan, Jim. Oh, Jim, where's Jim? I'm sorry, I'm scanning the room, you were behind <coughs> um, This conference, uh, this is pro forma language, but it's true. This would literally not have been possible without them, so we're all here thanks to their, <coughs> their wonderful work, both in advance and ongoing. As you can see, I've been up since 5.30, trying to map about, about 35 pages of notes from yesterday and organize them into a coherent uh, framework for discussion. Uh, you can be the judge of whether I succeeded or not, uh, and it's already a little messed up, that's too bad. Um, but uh, Sure, maybe, because it's going to be hard to read. Now, two quick caveats. Uh, Actually, everyone's, everyone's talk is represented here, uh, but I, and I'm going to try to touch on those points, but it's, uh, it's going to be difficult. So I'm going to do my best to represent, even in my discussion, things that everybody said. But I'm not going to try to do that equally. There were some extremely dense talks that um, uh, proposed, had multiple parts. So Sven's model, for example, Pippa's talk, um, Silvio's talk to some extent. I'm not going to try to pick apart those pieces. I'm going to refer to them as a whole and understanding that we've, you know, we, we were all there. So, and of course, if any of the actual, um, if the authors want to chime in and say, no, you've got that wrong, or I think this is really what's important, please do. And so here we go on a whirlwind tour of our day yesterday. Um, I actually want to start where we started, um, I think I'm biased towards Sylvia's problem, maybe, but uh, uh, we share a certain common sociological <laughs> culture, and even even yeah, and, and, and even a even a common lineage in Sylvia's uh, community. So, uh, uh, so I'm I'm partial anyway. Um, so, but I think that the problem with post-truth politics is, is central for multiple reasons. It's very easy to ignore. It's very easy to say, okay, well, yes, post-truth post -truth politics, we know, that, we know that there's no truth anymore. The truth is, truth is multiple. Truth is defined by multiple warring parties, tribes. But, so we, we acknowledge it in order to go on and then chart the mutual lying that goes on in the public sphere, or the mutual claims that go on in the public sphere, the pollution in the public sphere, if you will. I think it's a very critical to have this normative ideal in mind. Um, you know, really briefly, I'm not going to try to go through um, uh, all of the points that Sylvia raised, but I do want to, let's see if I can get it here. Sorry, 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 yeah. Um, one question in particular is possible, and it's going to be a guide stone for this discussion. How is a model of communicative commons possible? Or I might even say, is a model of communicative commons possible? Is it possible, and this goes to Deb's work too, and I'll come to it in a bit, is it possible to actually reweave the social fabric of the civil sphere? Are there things as scholars and as citizens to vote plants? that we can do to actually begin to, I don't want to say heal these divides, that's not our role or our problem, but to chart the context in which some form of cross-cutting conversation that might get us closer to the pragmatist concept of truth that Silvio is discussing, i.e. one in which we work for, uh, we work towards a model of not, uh, traditional deliberation, which I think we all know is probably past in many ways, but towards a model of truth, mutual truth seeking so that there can be some consensus on, fact, on facts again in politics. And whether that's possible or not, of course, is a, at best an open question, but I wanted to start there. Um, I wanted to also about initially uh, Daniel's concept of the civic epistemology, which I think is closely related to this, but they're two separate things. 
What is the question of can there be a, is, are we in a post-truth age? That's one question. The second question, is there a post-truth politics specifically? And the third, flowing from Daniel's question, is there a civic epistemology? Is there a framework of knowing that citizens acquire in their life worlds? I'm going to use that as a kind of a shorthand for the range of socializing uh, socializing and social structure and activities that lead to people's worldviews. In their life worlds, can we, is there a civic epistemology? Are there ways of knowing that, and to be precise or more precise, reduce the othering, the stigmatization, the, fr the, 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 well, the stigmatization of others that's thriving much of our tribalism? I'm going to come back to the concept of tribe too. I think it's very, very important. I think it's also really problematic. I think we're starting to rely on it way too much as a taken for granted category. And I want to question that because I think it's, we're at a turning point where it's about to get set in that wet cement that social capital did some years ago. And we're going to start talking about tribes, but it makes a, there's a whole lot of assumptions embedded in that idea that I want to at least question. Um, so you can see here just the areas that I broke this down into. Of course, any one of you could have done this differently, potentially, possibly, probably better. Um, but you would have had to get up at 5.30 to do it. So uh, post-truth politics, again, it's a touchstone. And I wanna, I'm going to be coming back to that. The meanings of populism, which is one of the first hard questions that we took up. What is this thing called populism? Uh, what is this thing called love? Uh, what is this thing called populism? Um, and how do we think about it? The communicative dynamics of populism, and this of course assumes that there's a populism, but the, whatever, regardless, the, the populism has a distinct set of communicative dynamics. Um, the changing political structure, which ran through, certainly not limited to, but uh, Lance's talk, Sherry's discussion, uh, Pippa's, and others too. But the, but the central idea, the central question of whether we actually are moving into a new political structural era, and I'm going to come back to that too. Um, problems of social structure, which I frankly think were given short shrift for the most part yesterday. We sort of treat them as underlying demographic variables that can be manipulated, and they are, and they should be. But yet there are sociological core issues that I think underlie the social structure of the civil sphere that we ought to be considering more systematically, although they did come up. In the center is analytical and methodological challenges. How do we move forward in this analysis? If we, can, if we, if we come to even a working dissensus <laughs> about what the core problems are, what are the analytical and methodological problems that we need to begin to address and unpack them? And certainly, you know, last but not least, what I think are a set of narrative issues, which are also bigger than narrative issues, that we also sort of dev touched on them, certainly others did in pieces, but I'm, I think we, we, we gave them a bit of short trip too, and I'm gonna come back to that towards the end. So briefly, um, the meanings of populism, I'm gonna be tacking back and forth here, sorry. Frank uh, raised this question in his talk uh, but Deb actually raised it for thing. What is populism? Good question. Um, and Frank? I have a couple of slides. You, you have? I have a couple of, of traditional slides. Uh, for those four. Okay, yeah. yes. Well, again, I'm condensing. This is my notes based upon no, all, of, perfect, perfect. all of your slides, highly condensed, so I. I I'm, I'm, no, I didn't show that. I didn't I'm, sig that. I'm signaling, but, but these are four separate meanings within the framework of the, e, of the EU project that Frank and others are working in. Populism is an ideology, populism is a political strategy, populism is a communicative strategy or communication strategy, and finally mediated populism, which I'm going to let Frank expand on later, but in some ways, it combines, I think, all of these elements with the idea that populism is a systematically mediated phenomenon, and it changes with the forms of mediation that we are, that we are living through right now. Um, the, uh, your challenge us to think, and I think this cross-cuts many different areas, 
the effects of populism. So, and I think it's very, I think it's an incredibly useful way to think about populism. It's actually a very pragmatic way to think about populism is what are its actual effects on different social groups? What are the workings of the mechanisms of populism on the ground? And if we begin to think about its effects, I think we can stay more grounded in how we think about the core problems that we need to be working with. Um, uh, sorry, some of this, some of these are straight out of my notes, folks. Not heavily edited this morning. Uh, populism sets boundaries. I think it's a critical insight. The populist movements, more than, um, perhaps more than anything else, I would argue, set boundaries between who is a citizen, who is not, who is part of the nation, who is not, who is in our group and who is out of our group, and how will we both define those boundaries and how will we treat people who are outside of those boundaries. Uh, and, and what role should they play, what role do they play, what should they play. Uh, in and out groups, the good and honest versus the, uh, us versus the malicious them is a beautiful way of expressing it. And I think that this is a core, core question when we think about the meaning of populism. And of course, th then specifically, the role of media in defining populism, which ties back to Frank's tying those elements together. And the idea that uh, social media circumvents gatekeepers, I think we're all pretty familiar and on board with that idea, which leads to polarization, misinformation, and critically, and again, I think this was an under, under interrogated issue yesterday, the, coro the corrosion of social cohesion. So at the very core of society, these movements and the form that they take are our, we've talked about social fragmentation, but I think social corrosion is also uh, another way of thinking about it. And even I would say civic degeneration, the threat of civic, con the, the, the emergence rather of civic conflict, and civic conflict that can and now is beginning to lead into civil violence. And of course, civil violence at its extreme leads to civil war. So I believe that there are stages of civic conflict that emerge out of populism, and then we think of the social structure of the civil sphere, we need to be thinking about those as a continuum, a very fuzzy continuum, but one in which different stages lead to an escalation. So there's an escalating dynamic here. Yes, Deb? So that's how you define corrosion, that process? I'm saying that's a central part, that's a central effect of the process. Social corrosion, the definition of others in groups, out groups, and the stigma is the definition, we all do that. That's a central part of social life. But the stigmatization of them, the dynamics that we're talking about, leads to new forms of block formation, which we call tribes. I'm going to still question that. Block formation, which then leads to civil conflict. As those blocks harden, we talk about that as polarization, primarily within the political communication sphere. And those blocks harden and then become opposing blocks that, that in which the core goal is to eliminate the other block sometimes by peaceful civil means and eventually possibly not by peaceful civil means. Um, Lance, of course, called for us to get rid of populism, get rid of the idea, um, and so did some other people. She was showing up, but uh, multiple definitions are a problem, he said. Stop using them. It's a fuzzy term. It's hard to define. And this is, I think, the most important thing. We we'll probably disagree on that in this room. I'm sure we do. I'm <laughs> positive that we do. But um, here's, the, here's the key point that I want to pull out of Lance's call to get rid of populism. He says it makes it sound like it will go away, that it's an epiphenomenon. And so that, I think, is a very critical question for us. Is populism an epiphenomenon? It's a, it's a momentary or cyclical, not momentary, but a cyclical sign of democratic dysfunction in the present and it will be a kind of restoration, whether that's a restoration of a new party order, you know, a la the SPD, young, young, what's his name? Carl, Carl Kubert, what's the young SPD guy? The Hughes leader. Yeah. I don't remember his name. Yeah, so will there be a youth resurgence? Will there be a return of social democracy? We don't know, possibly not, likely not. But I think that what Lance is saying is we make it sound like it will go away. He says it's happening as much on the left as on the right. I think that that's a really 
He's right, but it's also there's a critical disjunction and asymmetry there that we need to think about. And finally, Lance's core proposition is that this is really an organized right-wing reaction. And we need to think of it, I would, I would argue, in, in political sociological ter terms as a change in, in, in <coughs> the organization of the, of the state itself. That in fact, that there are organized forces, right-wing forces, that are actually seeking to subvert, for lack of a better way of putting it, liberal democracy. I'll come back to that too, which is a critical question that Sherry has raised. We, we, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm certain we won't agree on this, but I wanted to draw that point out. Are we in some dividing line, in a, in, a, in, in a fuzzy dividing line in history where in fact there's organized right-wing reaction? If those of you who looked at the paper, I don't know, different papers we all read, but the New York Times did they feature a fascist rally uh, in, in the middle of Milan, basically a very large one. So I think it's fair to ask, are we seeing not as populism, we need to distinguish between populist authoritarianism and fascism. In fact, I think it's even more important to maintain those distinctions now, analytically and clearly, but yet we may be seeing, or we should acknowledge that there are fascist elements of this reaction. And when we look at the continuum of possible civil disorder and leading to violence, we need to be aware that that exists, and not just anymore on the fringe, but it's at the heart of Milan, it can be at the heart of Berlin, it can be at the heart of Paris. And certainly, I would say not the heart of New York necessarily, but uh, the heart of Florida. Um, okay, so I'm going to come to same analytical methodological challenges uh, for a bit. I want to talk for a moment about the communicative dynamics. Obviously, that's something that unites all of us um, in many ways. Frank, of course, talked about populism as a, the voice of the unheard. I think that's a central both political and social and communicative dynamic that we need to be mindful of, that idea of the voice of the unheard as both and new media that express that voice, that are isom isomorphic with that problem <coughs> we, we aren't being listened to. The new media allow us to speak directly, quote, directly to power. Um, Frank also uh, raised the point that linked to this, that the isolation of the populist parties hasn't helped. It doesn't do any good to pretend that they should go away. They don't go away. They're not going away. And in fact, that strengthens them by allowing them to play a victim role. Uh, Devon raised the problem, and Chris has raised this too, and others have raised this up in our group, of the meta coverage of right-wing critiques, essentially driving uh, driving actually right-wing populism, which is a paradox that I think is a central paradox for us as communication scholars to think about. How, how does one actually do this? It's easier to point to it than it is to think about what might actually solve or solve. I'm going to use the term solve here. I'm going to put it in air quotes once. <laughs> We're not likely to solve anything, but at least think about analytically what the elements of a potential solution might be. If right-wing meta-critiques uh, meta coverage, rather, of right wing critiques actually drives them, is a, is a moving force for them, then what is a mainstream media organization to do? What, in fact, and this goes back again, straight back to Silvio's question. In a post truth era, can, how, if you can only talk about, or if you can't talk about, what right wing uh, movements are doing, well, how, how would you talk about them? If, you know, to go to our own colleague Lucas Graves, if fact checking actually and, and Talia's work, you know, if, uh, which I thought was fascinating in a number of respects. I'm not going to try to unpack it all here, but essentially, if selective exposure, and in fact, if it rather, if exposure leads to a sort of, I'm going to call it inverse inoculation, is that fair? Essentially, that one becomes proto inoculated to, 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 to already see why the arguments of the other are illegitimate, then I think we're in a very difficult moment here in communication, and I, we are. Um, and so what would, what would, and Talia, you know, very, very brilliantly described the dilemma here. And I think we have a lot of paradoxes here. We don't have a lot of answers, but we have a lot of paradoxes. I don't want to keep them paradoxes. I don't want to linearize them. The, this, this one is in particular, we, we have, um, you know, we know that selective exposure is related to polarization. Occasionally moderation, 
but it often increased, leads to increased polarization through the inoculation phenomenon that Todd described. And I think that this is, goes along with the problem of what sort of media system might actually, or what sort of media functions and, and what sort of media, in what media ecology might allow us to address this problem. And I feel like this is one of the biggest ones on our agenda. And I don't feel like we're addressing it, frankly, all of us directly enough. We're addressing it diagnostically, but not in terms of the pragmatic possibilities of it. And I think we ought to be paying more attention, which is at least in the spirit of Lance's call. Um, the crisis, Frank also noted that the crisis itself is communicatively constructed. And of course, there's multiple dimensions of that. It's constructed through communication. It's a crisis of the communication system. And populism moves through communication. So clearly, communication is a, is a central driver of this, of this crisis moment. Um, this, I think, uh, uh, I also want to mention Carolina's uh, observation and work on Facebook and new media logics. Um, that, that, and it's kind of almost got lost here, but it's, it's a, you sort of, it was a, not thrown away, but it's a slide, boom, here we are. But the idea that messages producing, promote, producing live content, promoting and sharing actually are the ones that travel farthest and most effectively is a really important point. I mean, it's part, it's part of a larger discussion, I realize. But I want to keep that in mind because I think it clearly uh, is related to these other problems of inoculation and selective exposure, so I'm going to make that link quickly. Um, Dev, um, De Deb, Deb's devastating <laughs> talk in some ways. It was both hopeful and hard to listen to. Um, this, when you, when you picked on the idea that, or you pulled out the idea that falsity, empirically, falsity travels much faster than truth, uh, this is really, really, really a huge problem in the communication system. Again, one that we have to identify, we have to hold constant and begin to understand what does that mean. I mean, not simply, again, diagnostically. We know what it means, more or less, diagnostically. We know what its implications for post-truth politics are, but what might be done about it? And again, the listening project that Deb is engaged in and others is a one really interesting step and experiment to begin to unpack this problem. And whether and how it works is something I think I, I will certainly hope and hoping to track very carefully. Um, I'm going to come back to sort of methods. and quick question? Yes, Dave. The idea that falsity travels faster and also further and deeper uh -huh. in, in sort of range and speed right. and truth, is that news to this room? I, it would be that that's the case on Twitter, but in word of mouth via email, via all the other mediums, with all the communication experts here. I'm just curious, is the headline, if you took out the on Twitter or online component, is this like well known in, in the communication world? I can no. let others answer. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Right, behind falsity, that's the question, what's behind falsity? I mean, Surprise and disgust. Yeah. Uh, and, and we need information Negative theoretic information. measures, yeah. and it's just things that are most unexpected because when you're making shit up, it's easier yeah. to Be surprised. Uh, to surprise. Yeah. So well, the emotions we found that correlated, we, we didn't make a causal claim. Uh, but I'm just curious, just as a human, uh, understanding of what human beings choose to propagate before they know whether it's true or false. So I think emotional. Sven hit this that there's a fairly sizable literature about negativity and negativity right. both being yep. having more value being sure. uh, exchanged more quickly, having deeper uh, uh, impact on memory. Alarm calls, uh, exactly. monkeys. And, and so and I think yeah. that kind it's of, if, if di disgust is, a, is an element, that might help explain yeah. or link it to that okay. literature. But I think the mm -hmm. idea that specifically false information travels faster than true information, that's new. On the other hand, Mark Twain knew this 100 years ago. No, right. Right. I'm looking yeah, around true. the world. But the question is, is it an expression? If it's not if compounded. A know, falsehood can go around the world. It's just really false information. It's a negative explain or something. So there's a Wait, well, that is not positive right. information. Plus negative information. I'm, 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 I'm going to play traffic cop. Thank you. Sorry. No, it's okay. But you're just. 
<laughs> you would make the point you just made, if you don't mind repeating it. Yeah, the, the question is, if it, if, is it really, really falsity or is it something behind falsity, you know? Mm -hmm. So uh, if, it, if falsity is more likely to be negative, yes. then it's, you know, I think we, we have a pretty good understanding of, of the factors that, uh, that drive attention. But falsity is not a usual category for that. It, it can't be, and I, I totally agree with yeah. you, because it, it, you can't see falsity yeah. in the moment. You don't, you don't know what the veracity is when you're hitting retweet. Could also it's be emotion. emotion. No, no, we looked at emotion, and we, yeah, but uh, negativity, thank you. That's, uh, just well, I think, part, so part of the answer is you know. yes, we know yeah. that in yeah. general, yeah. but the dynamics of it, the speed of it, the extent, the cascade mechanisms, yeah themselves were, I think, revealing, and I think that's part of the underlying question. And the mapping, too. And, well, like right, I mean, and, and, the, uh, and the literal, and figure, right. the literal mapping and even... Well, I mean, I, I think it's a, it's a fantastic find. It's interesting. The, the question, I guess, from my, from my perspective is, how much does it matter and why? And I also think that one of the things, we're tending to put this in a psychological frame as opposed to a collective behavior frame, right? So Francesca Paletta had this great piece on fake news published recently that argued that, drawing on her extensive work on things like social movements and the like, that sharing information, whether it's true or false, was more about signaling a collective identity and being part of a group. So, if you're already part of a particular team, right, you're going to share information whether it's true or not because it doesn't matter epistemologically whether it's true or not. Um, what matters for you who's sharing it is to say, I'm already a Republican or I'm already an anti-Hillary Clinton person, so I'm just going to share this whatever because I, it's more about me signaling to a certain audience or a network of other people, right, that sort of I'm in your camp in that sort of, in that, in that circumstance or that instance. Not saying that's a good thing, right? But it, it does put the, the problem in a bit of a different perspective than to say it's sort of an emotional reaction at that moment. And then I guess the broader question is, and I think this goes beyond the findings of your particular study, is to say, to okay. grapple with Silvio's sort of problem yesterday is how much factual information does the public need um, versus, right, sort of, heuristics in some way or identity in some way like what we have a very overly cognitive sort of discussion around democracy going on right now and I just think we should sort of put on the table to sort of say like what why is that important like why is it important for people to be super cognitively heavy rational information processing citizens in their lives and their livelihoods I'm going to as you see Daniel Christ identity and stories <laughs> uh, <laughs> So Sorry, oh, right, right. It's, it connected to this sort of discussion. But that was the, I, I took, it's 15 years of German, and I cannot say your last name. I think name the, the German is appropriate. <coughs> I, I apologize. <laughs> if every time I look at it, my EI, my ninth grade German teacher, EI. Um, okay, sorry. Um, in any case, actually I'm going to use that as a quick transition then over to hear the problem of the civil sphere and narrative structure. Since it's been brought up, it makes sense, and I'm going to return to the political issues and analytical issues at the end uh, in, uh, shortly. Um, so I'm not going to repeat what Daniel just said, but essentially identity and stories are an essential part of how we make sense of the world, navigate the world. We don't give that sufficient attention. Um, this is part of the dynamics of resentment that Kathy has articulated so well. But I think in some ways, I wish Kathy was here because I'd rather have this colloquy directly, but Kathy has deeply described the dynamics of resentment. Arlie Hochschild deeply described the dynamics of resentment, even called it the deep story. But Arlie claimed, even in using that term, she didn't really unpack what is a deep story. Right, so I think that's, a, and Daniel raises this question fairly directly, that's, that's a core problem for us. If people have these deep stories, as Hawk's Child claims, and I think Kathy at least implicitly is claiming, rural consciousness is not an ideology simply, it's a deep story about who we are, it's about people's core identities, it's about, again, us versus them, to go back to this, then how those boundaries get uh, um, 
navigate it again is a very, very critical central question, and it's a narrative question. Um, and we don't do that very well. In Polcom and Com generally, we sort of have you know, narrative people over here doing their stuff. I think that we need to begin to look at ways that we can begin to think of narratives as an essential part of the civil sphere more generally, and as part of this truth-telling, truth-moving, false, falsity-defining problem specifically. Um, just uh, quickly here, um, talked about the dynamics of resentment of cutting in line. I think that we need to then, as I said, unpack the narrative res of resentment specifically in a better way that we've, than we've managed to do. Um, Deb and I were talking yesterday, he's got a fascinating, he got about 20 fascinating projects, but um, one is to work, I mean, I'm describing your project. You wanna say a minute or, or about the Hollywood thing, or should I just do it? You can do it. Okay, <laughs> all right, so ba brief, briefly, Deb's group is working with, uh, to analyze multiple, how many Hollywood scripts? Uh, I don't know, thousands. Thousands of Hollywood thousands scripts for their underlying narrative in order to basically begin to see, put together some sort of everyday life narrative. Um, a lot of those are based upon Christopher Fogler's uh, hero myth. Some of you may know that it's kind of a handbook for script writing in Hollywood, which is a specific kind of mythic structure that gets used in the construction of many, many movies and films. I actually think that we have a different narrative structure, or potentially a different narrative structure of everyday life. Um, I've coined the term here, morphology of the populist folktale. Um, I think that there is a potential morphology that when we look at these stories, we tend to look at you know, word clusters, um, associations, again, critically important, but there's also perhaps a way that we can unpack these narrative elements to see how these narratives are constructed, what their fundamental elements are, how they're ordered in time and space by different groups in order to achieve different ends. So that's just a challenge throwing out to the group that how we might think about how, uh, how narrative structure can be modeled more systematically. And one, not exemplar, but one example is Claudia Strauss, cognitive anthropologist Claudia Strauss is making sense of public opinion which is particularly useful because it deals with contradictory narratives, how people hold contradictory ideas at the same time within their constructed narratives and worldviews. And I believe that that's something that we might pay much better attention to because modeling ambiguity is potentially the bridge back to the communicative commons that we're talking about. If we understand how people can hold ambiguity without necessarily drawing bright lines between themselves and others, we might be able to get closer to um, what we can do about this. Um, social structure I'm not going to say a lot about because there's a lot to say. I do want to draw attention again to the problem of status anxiety, which came up uh, in a number of contexts. I want to return back to the problem of what a tribe is. Um, we talked about tribes. We talked about tribes as if they're unitary groups, right? And of course, they're becoming more unitary in some dimensions. But I think there's a, also a modeling, empirical and analytical modeling challenge. We are all, you know, identities are always cross-cutting. The question is how they line up. Uh, Damon Santola, his 2015 piece, I'm gonna push it a little bit, a discussion of Blau and Schwartz and the problem of heterogeneity and inequality and intersecting cross-cutting social circles. I think that it's a problem that we could begin working on to sort of, when we, when we accept the language of tribe, we're actually accepting the language of consolidation and civil conflict. And the challenge is to begin to see how do people not form into tribes and what are the communicative dynamics that lead to greater acceptance of ambiguity, tolerance of cross-cutting viewpoints. And the tribal language, I think, partly, even though it's useful, plays into that. Uh, I'll come back to the other analytical issues in a moment. I want to jump over to political structures. I think Sherry made a, a number of obviously critical points. I think the distinction between illiberalism or a democracy, illiberal democracy, authoritarianism, and I would add fascism to that, is a really important continuum. Um, it's one that we wrestle with here in Wisconsin. Chris is going to talk about that in a moment. But it's a non-trivial problem, right, for people particularly who tend to be on the left, 
who, you know, how, how is it that these people actually voted those people in? Well, sometimes they do it with full knowledge of who they're voting for and why. And illiberal democracy can be a choice in a democratic society, and I think that's a really critical, critical idea to hold, and it speaks to Lance's problem from a different, uh, an orthogonal perspective. Um, Cherry, Hernando, others talked about the dec decline of democratic institutions, democratic dysfunction as a driver, and I think that that's another critical question, but I'm not going to have time to go into it. Um, I've mentioned Lance's claim. I'm, I guess I'm not going to have time to unpack that either, but I think it's, again, I'm just going to say it's important for us to ask ourselves, so we entered a new historical moment. Is this an organized reaction? Is this a lining up of structural forces that's moving from authoritarianism or towards authoritarianism and from authoritarianism to something else? I think that that's we're not going to reach consensus on that question here. Um, Pippa's, uh, Julia's point, which is critical, that populism has a geography. American politics is regional, but it's increasingly nationalized. Is something that we need to keep in mind, not just here in the United States, but probably in very different forms in Europe as well, in other places in the world, that we don't really understand these geographies well enough. Um, and that they are at the heart of, uh, among other things, Trumpian populism here in the United States. Two, two, I'll close on sort of two dilemmas, two, two problems in Pippa's work and um, uh, Lance's proposal. Lance's proposal first. Lance essentially, for many years, has been propagating the idea of actualizing citizenship. Young people disengaging from parties, doing things on their own, using these new network modalities in order to self-organize in civil society movements. Now and now, and it's true, right? So it's important to recognize that it's empirically descriptive. On the other hand, we might ask ourselves, is that actually leading to the very kind of withdrawal from voting in politics that Lance is now saying is at the very heart of right-wing political ascendancy? Right. Young pe he showed us those uh, graphs. Young people don't vote. That's literally the difference in the, in the ascendance of right-wing populism. <clears throat> so there's actually a contradictory dynamic, and I think we need to think of that as a paradox again. That young people don't vote because if they're engaged in actualizing citizenship, then maybe there's a problem with actualizing citizenship. We ought not to simply accept it as a valorizing concept. Um, of course, the answer is not to say you kids vote either, right? So that's another democratic paradox that I think we need to be thinking about. Pippa, I think, addresses from a different dimension. She actually took the more sort of, it's the opposite side of Lance's, it, no, it's, a, it's, a, it's the opposite part of a, a different part of a continuum. Pippa's essentially saying, on the one hand, there's a movement towards authoritarianism, and she's doing it in a brilliant way, and tr I think tr accurate way. But at the heart of this is post-materialism and the reaction to post-materialism. I, mean, I, I realize that she's modified that language, but I'm going to use it anyway for the shorthand purposes. Well, these tipping points assume the reaction, but the reaction essentially, in the, you know, in the long run, we're all dead, but in 10 years, the emerging democratic majority will demographically have somehow, you know, my generation will have died out and presto change -o. Um, hopefully not in 10 years, just to be clear. But uh, and presto change of, uh, we will have the ascendancy. Now, Pippa, of course, doesn't take that position, but it's implicit, right? So we have another paradox here. Either we have emerging, you know, silent, either, either the silent revolution is still working its way through the <coughs> cohorts, and the problem is a cohort conjuncture, or else it doesn't work that way. And I think that we need to ask ourselves that question in that way. Very briefly to close, finally, I think we have a specific set of methodological issues that we all could be asking ourselves, and these have come up, different folks uh, all throughout. Uh, I think Sven's challenge for an integrated theoretical model, which I'm not going to unpack in a minute and a half, or try to, but essentially the need to work at these macro and micro levels, but also, as, we, as he said, and as we talked about a little bit afterward, the need for a meso level here too, that the bridging of these levels, I think the ambition of your model is actually important. I'm glad to see that you're actually not taking the advice that you give to your graduate students and trying to put this into a larger model framework. Um, the structure of influence in tribes we've talked about, but the Deb's work 
and others too. Looking at tribes and network substructures, I think, is really important. Again, as I've said with my qualification, that networks are not tribes, even if they appear to correlate with certain kinds of core distinctions. And we need to look at how how those work fluidly. Um, the problem, which is Chris is going to talk about in a moment, so I'm not going to get into it, of modeling whole ecologies. And a central problem in modeling ecologies, and this I think goes to Sven's model and problem too, is the dynamics of loops and cascades, which essentially create new sorts of problems and indeterminacies in ecological modeling of any sort. And I think that if we take ecology seriously, and I hope we do, then we need to actually deal with those looping dynamics and cascade problems because that's actually the heart of the dynamic of any ecology. Okay, I apologize if I've short trifted anything. I'm not, well, I should say not if. I know I've short trifted many things, but thank you for letting me just give you a quick reaction to yesterday. And now I give you Chris and Mike. Okay. <coughs>
um, a political foment, you could call it, where the home of both Bob La Follette, uh, perhaps the leading figure in progressive politics, but also Joe McCarthy on the far right of, of course, the, the, uh, the, the communist witch hunts of the 1950s. So you have a, a history of uh, mixed government, political foment, as I said, active civic engagement, probably grounded in a German, the, the German Scandinavian heritage of um, uh, Wisconsin, and also a history of structural support of uh, civic engagement. So Wisconsin certainly stands as in the in the upper Midwest and, and nationally as a place of powerful civic engagement um, uh, and uh, political innovation. More recently, we've mentioned Scott Walker in Act 10, but I want to connect him more specifically now to some of the themes that we talked about yesterday. Uh, as I mentioned yesterday, he was elected in 2010 as part of the, the Tea Party rise, and uh, which, which itself was a response to both the recession and the election of Obama in 2008. He introduced this budget repair <coughs> bill in early 2011. So this was really his first, the first thing that he did. It was literally weeks into office he introduced this budget repair bill. And he introduced it as something that was needed for the state of Wisconsin to fix our finances, mainly following um, the Great Recession. But its specific target was sort of more important than that. It was targeted at public sector workers. So remember what we talked about yesterday and, of course, Kathy's work, um, that the, pu the public sector and especially state employees are seen by many Wisconsinites as elites enjoying an unfair degree of, uh, of benefits, especially from work. Could yes? Could you be more specific what you mean public sector? sector because it's like, who is there? Yeah, absolutely. Great question. And yeah, please ask questions. If, if uh, uh, So the public sector is made up of everybody who works for the state government. So this would be the people who work in the state offices here in Madison who do everything that a state off, uh, the state does. Um, uh, so you know the Department of Natural Resources, Health and Human Services, all these kinds of state uh, um, workers. But it's not only that. It's also the university. So all of us uh, are uh, at, at the University of Wisconsin are state workers. Um, and it also means school teachers. So uh, teacher, public school teachers throughout the state are um, uh, public sector workers. <laughs> and just it, might be, it might be worth mentioning also that they exempted what they call first responders, so police, firefighters, corrections. So security was not included in the people that were affected by Act right. right. Well, their benefits were also adjusted. Am I right? It was the collective bargaining that didn't affect. But anyway, um, just a, a further point in just a sec, Mike, about uh, school teachers and DNR. As Kathy's pointed out, those are really important categories because they are, by and large, the people who aren't in Madison. So the public school teachers are throughout the state so that any person in Wisconsin will see those people uh, um, uh, in their community. And that's relevant because if you're in a small community in outstate Wisconsin or a suburb, uh, it may be that it's the school teacher who has, in some ways, the most economic stability because they have a job, they may have, if they've taught for a while, they have seniority, which means they're very unlikely to lose their job, and they have relatively good state benefits in terms of a retirement plan and, uh, and, and especially health benefits. Mike, we got One other bit of background on Act 10 in the context of representation, I think that Sherry and others were talking about yesterday, is that when Walker ran for office, he did not mention this, and then it was the first thing he did, which was sort of, sort of a surprising, it rocked into the political system in ways that the state maybe had not seen from a government from a from elected governor. Yeah. Then the Act 10 had two pieces which are also relevant. So first, it effectively reduced benefits. So what it actually did was made us pay out of pocket more of some of our benefits. So the percentage of our health that was covered went down, the percentage of our retirement that was covered went down. And so this materially saved the state money. There was just a dollar amount attached to this. Secondly, though, and more sort of controversially, um, it ended public sector, you effectively ended public sector unionizing in, in the state. It said that if you are part of the public sector, you can no longer collectively bargain, which is essentially the heart of what union organizing is, you can no longer collectively bargain for your contracts with the state. So this is just a front, really a frontal assault on unions in the state because it takes a, a huge sector of the union base in Wisconsin and says, you can't have a union anymore. <clears throat> and of course, the argument is that there might be some economic benefit to this. But in the immediate term, only reducing the benefits actually helps to balance the budget. So this is more of a directly political 
move. And I'm, I'll come back to that in a moment. Any other questions about Act 10? Okay, so we've, as we've already mentioned, there was quite a response to Act 10. Immediate protests. Scott Walker is a Coke dealer, it says <laughs> one sign. Uh, lots of colorful <laughs> protests, signs. Wisconsin workers, we support you. We got a visit from our buddy Sarah, um, who I'm somewhere in the background there. Me and Hemant went to uh, Sarah's talk on the Capitol. Um, so Sarah Palin, um, news media from around the country descended on Wisconsin. So you would go down there, and on a typical day, there were tens of thousands of protesters milling around. The Capitol was actually occupied. There were people physically sleeping in the Capitol, uh, hundreds of people. It, it smelled of people living in the Capitol, <laughs> which was really interesting. And as we'll talk about in a moment, um, this is significant far be for political reasons far beyond the political mobilization of the left. Because the perception of this, the, the, the images that were coming out of Madison and going around the state had an important impact on the way the public uh, viewed, sort of average Wisconsinites viewed what was happening in Wisconsin. And I think Mike is going to talk a little bit about that in just a moment. Um, here's what happened. Uh, um, following Act 10 and the protests, Act 10 was passed very controversially. At one point, the uh, Senate Democrats in Wisconsin actually left the state. They went to uh, Rockford, Illinois, so that they wouldn't have to vote. And there was a debate about whether the governor could use the state police to capture them and compel them to come back and vote, which is I mean, unheard of uh, in, in our, our politics. Um, ultimately, it was passed through a slightly backdoor deal that the Republicans, I think, ultimately had to say that there was going to be no budget consequences of the bill. Wasn't that right? They said there were no budget implications, so they could pass it through another mechanism. Um, the left organized a petition drive to hold a recall election of Scott Walker. Uh, we've only had three recall elections of governors in the country, so this was going to be the third one. They successfully uh, gathered nearly a million petition signatures, which we've calculated represents about it means that about one in five adults in Wisconsin signed one of these petitions. So extraordinary mobilization around that. The, help, the recall was held in June, and Walker prevailed fairly decisively, being the first American governor uh, to be uh, held at a, for a recall election and to survive. This is the map of Walker's uh, recall election victory. So uh, blue are counties that went against Walker, obviously Milwaukee County and Dane County, then also the counties in the far northwest. Um, red are all the counties that supported Walker. And the size of the bubble is the percentage margin of victory within the county. And what's kind of not notable is it's actually not the outstate counties that supported him most overwhelmingly. Certainly not the southwest, which I talked a little bit about before. But of course, he's, he's got strong support among the outstate counties, but where it's most powerful is actually the southeast, the relatively more industrialized and suburban southeast, especially those wow counties that we mentioned, those uh, historically white flight counties actually immediately surrounding uh, the city of Milwaukee. So um, this is an important sort of geographic dimension to what we've been talking about in terms of uh, rural consciousness, the, the political geography of Wisconsin. Um, Walker's core support is, is, he's certainly supporting the outstate, but his core support is in that uh, Milwaukee core. How do you explain it? What's the reason for that? Um, the, well, the Wow counties are, are very, very conservative. So part of it is um, uh, historically white flight. So if you're, from, you're familiar with white flight, uh, uh, whites leaving the inner city of Milwaukee as African Americans arrived and as, as whites got the money to in the uh, 50s to 70s, essentially. Um, uh, he also, in, in Walker's particular case, Walker was also county executive of Milwaukee. So he had uh, quite a history as somebody who was standing up to clean up the city, to remove corruption, crime. What were his other major issues in Milwaukee? It was, a, it was, a, it was actually the pensions, pensions of the, the Democratic there was a pension office scandal. Office. Um, yeah, so that certainly uh, is part of that. Um, there, we, can also, we could also go into, uh, um, when we get to the primaries between Ted Cruz and Donald Trump, there's a split um, within the Wisconsin Republican Party so that the Southeast, the relatively more uh, business-oriented uh, Republican Party, is strongly for Cruz, and the outstate goes more strongly for Trump. 
And, and Cruz won Wisconsin. Cruz actually won Wisconsin. Your, so your, there's... Your question is also, you know, this question is, it's certainly my question, but it's also maybe social sort. I mean, people are, I mean, there's a, the loud counties are known as conservative bastion. I mean, if you want to be surrounded by that, you might sort of so that. There's, count, there's more suburban areas throughout North Milwaukee, the blue live in Milwaukee many years, Shorewood, Whitefish Bay, in Milwaukee County, they're affluent, but also more liberal. Yeah. Um, uh, one thing, oh, the last thing I was going to say, I, I think it's, it's also, also worth going back to Kathy's points about rural consciousness on this, though, that rural consciousness is not exclusively a geographic designation, that it's more of an identity and a, and a sense of perception. And so I think you find some of those in the Wow counties, even though we wouldn't consider them or think of them as very rural places. Um, Chris? Yeah? Why are those three counties in the north so constantly blue? Um, uh, history of industry and, and union organizing, especially iron work. So the iron range is in Wisconsin and Minnesota in that area, and also timber. And so it's, uh, it's, that's channeled through union organizing historically. And a lot of left wing fins. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then the big blue dot in the middle of the state, uh, uh, towards the north, is a, a very large Native American. That's Native American. Well, Menominee County. Yeah. Thank Thanks you. Doesn't he the same as the Tosin? Um, his, his victory in 2010? <coughs> That's a good question. It's going to be very similar. It's similar. Um, yeah. 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 Other questions? Okay, then just to give you a sense of the, the division that Wisconsin has really been on this razor edge politically for quite a while. So I just mentioned Walker's recall win. I had to throw this in. Uh, that some, same summer, there was actually a physical fight. One of the Wisconsin Supreme Court justices grabbed another by the neck. Uh, in within the Supreme Court, um, and there's and that's sort of the most official example of these sorts of anyone reelection skirmishes. Anyone then you anyone reelection? Um, <laughs> and it was a woman who we grabbed yeah. in there, just in case. In November 2012, Obama won re-election, and Tammy Baldwin won a Senate seat, so it became the first openly gay person in the U.S. Senate. So this sense of in 2010 and 2012, Scott Walker is winning. Uh, in November of 2012, Obama is winning quite handily, as well as Tammy Baldwin is winning this seat. So you've got this sense of back and forth. And Baldwin defeated a three-time governor who was very popular, Tommy Thompson. Oh, yeah. yeah, Baldwin did, yeah. Um, and so there's, there's also a dynamic here that goes a little bit to Lance's point about, the, about turnout issues on the left. So um, for quite a while, we had this back and forth in which midterm elections, during which uh, uh, Democratic turnout is depressed, would tend to go to Republicans. So Walker could win in 2010 and 2014. Whereas in the presidential election years, you'd have a larger turnout among young people um, uh, uh, and so forth, and you'd have uh, uh, presidential victories that went to the Democrat. So 2014, Walker won the re-election. In spring of 2016, as I mentioned, it was actually Ted Cruz who beat Trump for the Republican um, nom uh, nomination. Um, uh, in part because of strong support from talk radio, especially Charlie Sykes, a, a Milwaukee um, a talk radio host, who he's, Mike is going to talk more about. But he came out strongly against Trump and partly helped power that southeast part of the state, those establishment Republicans for Cruz. Um, and then in 2016, as you know, uh, Trump beat Clinton, and also Ron Johnson defeated Russ Feingold, our longtime Democratic senator who'd been very popular up to 2010. I think you can make the argument that he uh, 20, uh, that Feingold really suffered the consequences of a Tea Party surge. There was a significant amount of optimism that Feingold would do well in 2016, uh, but didn't didn't, and he was, was not incumbent. defeated. Sorry, Feingold was not incumbent. Feingold was not incumbent. He was trying to come back to his old seat. I don't. Explain Walker wins in June, and so close in time, Obama wins re-election. So Obama yeah. uh, won Wisconsin. Yeah, handily, handily, yeah. And they're handily. handily. The same percentage in both of those elections. And they went it's, opposite ways. Yeah, yeah. And yet it's only a few months apart. Yep. That seems like the most surprising contradiction to Abs in this. It's a good point. I think I would point to two things. One is. Uh, strategic incompetence on the part of the Democrats in organizing the petition drive in such a way that the recall election would occur in the middle of the summer as opposed to uh, during the presidential, on the same presidential ballot. 
Um, so that meant a number of things. It meant that you had some of the same dynamic of a midterm election. There was less sort of national level media buzz. There was less general turnout. You also didn't have students, the student body, uh, that is a critical organizing, I wouldn't say critical, but an important organizing mass for elections in Wisconsin had dispersed to other parts of the state and to other states, so you didn't have that core of uh, tens of thousands of votes. Um, so that's the first thing I would mention. Um, and then the other thing that we're going to get to is the level of reaction against the protest movement and recall movement among Wisconsin in general was very powerful. And so I, I think Walker ultimately benefited from that, uh, which was obviously not a factor for Obama in the fall. That's one of the points to make about the Cruz defeats Trump in the Wisconsin primary. I mean, that was an organized effort, certainly you know, cycled through Charlie Sykes, but broadly reflective of what Paul Ryan wanted, what uh, uh, Lance Priebus, uh, Ryan Priebus wanted. This was the heart of the Wisconsin GOP political machine organizing around this. And you can see that in some of the Twitter maps, how coordinated the right was in terms of communicating and reinforcing each other's message. And Scott Walker endorsed Cruz as well. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, can you give us a sense of turnout across these? Uh, yeah, I can in general. Um, yeah, yeah, actually, if you could look it up. So um, I want to say that the recall turnout was comparable <coughs> to the midterm turnout. Is that right? Yes. People yes. sense. Um, Obama's re-election turnout was strong. Not as, I think I think we full track nationally here. Not quite as strong as 2008, but strong. Uh, 2014 was a, again down to um, uh, midterm levels, and then uh, November. Uh, I can't speak to the Republican primary. Um, November 2016 was. Um, there's been a lot of discussion about depression and turnout among young people and uh, non-white people in Wisconsin. So this was definitely a, a factor. Um, in 2016, especially as compared to 2008 and 2012. Voter ID came in before 2016. That's right, we're going to mention that. We had uh, voter ID and a couple of other measures that uh, would help to depress uh, certain votes. Um, I can't speak to white or Republican turnout in 2016. Do you know, Mike? Lower than 2012, but higher than midterm. Lower than 2012, but okay, so also lower than 2012. Okay. There's some vague answers for you. Yeah, that's great. Um, okay, so some key points that we want to make. Ways in which this was, these Wisconsin dynamics reflected some of the, the trends that we've been describing as populism. I want to be a little bit specific about this. Question that we're asking, in what ways did Walker's agenda and message presage what we now describe as this American populist surge? This is a connection that Kathy, that Kathy made in fall of 2016 um, in the, uh, the Washington Post, arguing that in some ways, Donald Trump had picked up on themes that, that Walker was using. So in Walker's agenda, we certainly saw the demonization of elites. This especially was in the case of uh, uh, public sector workers and university workers who were portrayed as elites who benefited at the expense of taxpayers, who enjoyed lavish benefits um, and didn't understand uh, the, the, the common people, as, as Kathy has noted. Uh, uh, one way in which Walker did this was he often contrasted not only in-state elites, but especially Washington, D.C., that we're not going to do stuff the way they do in Washington, D.C. We're going to base our decisions on homegrown Wisconsin wisdom. Folks in Wisconsin was a phrase that he uh, enjoyed using. He sometimes combined these, uh, sort of this idea of the people, with uh, this idea of boldness, that the people are calling for bold reforms, that they want us to strike back against these elites who've been running things. He, he used this phrase, uh, they're looking for somebody to, to shake things up. And he's going to offer these bold reforms. So in that way, he was able to frame Act 10, even though he, as Mike said, he hadn't really talked about it, as this bold move that the people were calling for. So just to give you a sense of the turnout levels, uh, 2010, uh, this is when Walker got elected, uh, 400,000 400, eligible voters. Uh, 2.17 million voted. 2012, uh, again, uh, about 4 million, 400,000 eligible voters, 3.1 million voted. So almost a million additional voters in the presidential cycle. I think the recall was similar to the midterm level. Might have been a little bit higher. A little bit higher. Just yeah. a, a quick clarification, <coughs> clarifying question. Um, 
So the story that, that you guys are telling is sort of, it's, it's one really of a lack of Democratic turnout during the, the recall, or how, much, how many of those people are splitting their votes, in essence, to go to what Deb asked, who are voting for Obama and then turning around and, and voting against the recall? There's so something what we showed yesterday, I think, is people in economically depressed areas, including Democrats, said, I'm not going to support Democrats. Those were the people. Yeah, they okay. said, I'll, I'll, I'll vote for the Republican. And they, 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 they soften their support for Republicans. And that was true on both ends, right? If you were, if you were in economically thriving places, your, your ideology drove how you voted. If you were in, in more economically depressed places, you were considering other factors. Is there publicly available identity of who votes for the, um, the recalls, or voter registration that links to the recalls? Uh, you can. You can find out who voted in the recall election. You can't, you can't find out which way they voted. Right, right. You can find out who signed the recall petition. Every single yeah. Thing, which was another big yeah. fight. Does and that, that, that answer your question? Jobs. Yeah. People have gotten fired. Students have lost scholarships because they signed the. The governor kicked somebody <laughs> off the student board of regents for having signed. We, mm -hmm. yeah. we had a student who had an internship at the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel. That, that's, that's legal? Uh, yeah. <laughs> in, the new, in the new world, it's legal, yeah. especially when you're, legal. With it, that's when you're Supreme Court is packed, it's legal. Yeah, it's you gotta it. uh, yeah I think there'd be directions against the like, like, First Amendment. So just to make clear, when he was going to make the league, I mean, as far as I understand, he was a part of the political elite. Yeah. Right. So yeah. He was. The for him was the people who were like on the state level that they later went after in this act ten. Exactly. Yeah. He was describing. So it's not political elites that he's. I mean, discussing political elites. On the political elites, he he went against them for the Washington D.C. In fact, here it was the economical and elites that he went after. Not even the economical elites, but I would say the social and even cultural elites. Mm -hmm. So he was pointing at, uh, so it, and this is where we directly connect to the politics of resentment. That he's he's talking about us versus them, the makers and the takers. Actually, the makers and the takers is the perfect uh, an analogy for this case. So he's talking about. He's describing makers as people who work and make things, the people who work in factories and the people who grow food, the people who actually make things. And then he's framing the state workers as the takers. Because it's so amazing, those are teachers. I mean, we all have children. <laughs> yes, yes, it is amazing. <laughs> really. This is like a, I mean, arms. nobody would teach, touch te teachers. I think in, in, in teachers lost tenure too, and that. So yeah. 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 And yeah. It was it's really really devastating. Single yeah. biggest surprise reading Kathy's book was a pervasive attitude towards teachers. Yeah. In, in mm -hmm. I was just it was like such a surprise. But there was an active. Can't. I'm sorry, Chris. No. There was an active okay. sub Rosa campaign. The Republicans actually circulated oh, yeah. material in those communities saying, do you know, like, the enemy on your block, this teacher has a pension, this teacher is making this money. So they actively demonized. It wasn't simply an effect. It was an active act of demonizing teachers as public servants, as elites. Yeah, there was and direct mail saying, this is the benefit the teacher who lives on your street earns or not earns. Right. So yes, demonization and direct yeah. targeting yeah. Yeah. as a propaganda yeah. campaign. But I yeah. think this runs with, with your point yesterday. So my mother rails against public school teachers all the time because she has no job security. Right. She has no retirement benefits. Mm -hmm. Like she works a shitty job. Mm -hmm. And like she looks out and it's sort of it's that fostering of that resentment where like why why should we be paying taxes I mean, I disagree with her, but like that's where it's coming from, I think. Like, that's the story you guys told yesterday. But it's not that she will appreciate what you achieved with those teachers? You know, like In an abstract sense, yeah, I'm a product of public schools, but, <laughs> but that's, I mean, how relative, no. that's, that's how relative deprivation works. Yeah. Right. It's stronger. Yeah. These kind of attacks, by the way, work even in a place like New York, which is overwhelmingly liberal. I mean, uh, yeah. you see similar kinds of attacks on teachers for the same kind of reasons. They have mostly for the job, the summer's job security, off. which is really right. Depressing. It's job security and yeah. pension. Yeah, that's the, that's yeah. the crux of it. And the people who like teachers the most are janitors in the schools. <laughs> Actually, no. I mean, it's, there's some truth to that. It's the people who are closest and see these elites 
you know, this elite first grade teacher, but it's what Daniel just said is absolutely true. It's re and, and Sven too, it's, it's the relative positioning. I was also a friend who was like, here's their salary, but they work eight months a year. Yeah. Here's the kind of benefits yeah. you're getting. Here's the kind of security. You don't have that. I mean, it's right. like, to the point yeah. he's getting made repeatedly, it's like their job, it's important, but it's so cushy. Do they deserve all this? Shouldn't they kick in more to their pension? Shouldn't they? And you know, and that resonated with the public that was looking at a very depressed economic state, saying, I lost my job, my community's depressed. Why should they be getting this? Put some more into my community. Quit giving it to them. We're going to add a couple points. Um, one, if I jump, jump back in here. Um, <laughs> One is that to, to highlight part of Kathy's work, which is the intersection of the Walker communication and the underlying resentment, and the fact that he's articulating uh, in his messages some of the things that are being felt in exactly these ways that people are describing. So that's one of our core interests here. How do these underlying identities and resentments intersect with, become mobilized by, or fostered by, is the word Daniel just used, by uh, elite communications, or kind of called out by them? Also, like to just note really quick in response to Daniel's earlier point about uh, the recall election, one of our one of our findings and things that we need to keep in mind is the level of indignation within Wisconsin that was incited by the recall process, mm -hmm. the sense of injustice toward Walker, even among people who might not have agreed with Act Ten, yeah. that recalling him wasn't right, that he should be allowed to serve his term and then he might be voted out, but that the recall was illegitimate in this way. So I think there's something to, in terms of people voting against it, even if they didn't <coughs> like him. Uh, so those things, two things together. Um, okay, uh, I talked about makers and takers. Then finally, another important point that we saw here. Um, Walker had a strategy that's been described as divide and conquer. Clearly he was trying to cleave the state into us's and them's, but he was also going beyond that in a sort of anti-pluralist <coughs> sense. And that's where the second half of Act 10, the decimation of public unions, was really important. This is a report that the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel put out um, a couple of years ago. Uh, so no state has lost more of its labor union identity since 2011 than Wisconsin. So it was a, a frontal assault on labor unions that worked. This is a political attack on the Democratic Party because in the United States and in Wisconsin especially, unions have historically been a political pillar of the Democratic Party in terms of being able to communicate with Democratic publics, in terms of turning them out, um, and so forth. So there was an anti-pluralist aspect to this um, in the sense that uh, um, the Republicans were targeting the, really the lifeblood of the opposing party, trying to eliminate them as, a, as possible opposition. Finally, um, we mentioned earlier voter ID. So there's Gerrymandering uh, happening in our state to the extent that it's now before the Supreme Court. Um, voter ID was brought up and passed quickly here, which also depressed uh, turnout post uh, 2012, I, I want to say, um, including in 2016. Um, but other policies have been uh, essentially far, far right, far right uh, experiments. Uh, right to work, which allows, which, which further undermines unions. Drug tests for welfare recipients, and so on. So um, Wisconsin, again, seems to be a kind of laboratory. But the question is, of what? Um, La Lou has, has used the, I think, evocative phrase, um, laboratory of oligarchy. And I'll just make a couple points. And if, if he wants to chime in, this goes back, actually, to some of Lance's points um, and the role of uh, very conservative money in supporting populists, which actually has only been mentioned a few times by Lance and, and a couple of others here. But uh, there's a, a strong case to be made that Wisconsin was seen, even at the beginnings of the Walker stage, as a test bed for experimenting with a far right, uh, heavily pro-business um, uh, theory of, of politics. Um, and indeed, this happened partly, uh, partly perhaps premeditatedly, perhaps um, uh, incidentally. But uh, the recall of Walker also helped to put him on the national map. So the fact that he was recalled, that he was generating so much opposition from the left, from the resist group, as Silvio pointed us to um, uh, yesterday, uh, helped to build this national following, uh, both of, of average conservative uh, citizens who saw him as standing up to these leftist resistors and, and uh, state-embedded elites, but also among national donors. 
And it was that set of national donors that enabled him to stage his uh, fairly brief uh, presidential run. Do you want to chime in, Devon? Just one thought, and that is, in Wisconsin, in terms of a media market, it's not hard for well-funded groups to take it over. You've got, you know, Wisconsin and Milwaukee, and you're covering a good chunk of the state in political advertising. Madison, Milwaukee. Madison, Milwaukee. Yeah. So specifically, in the Bradley Foundation and Koch Brothers, you have both a Wisconsin-centered institute in terms of the Bradley Foundation, which is essentially a, a very conservative, we describe it as a think tank, Lou, or no, it's policy. No, uh, it's a $600 billion foundation. It's one of the largest in the United States. And it's actively funding state policy networks, including the one in North Carolina. It's a, it's a seedbed for state policy networks, which are, which Lance was describing yesterday, a series of now in all 50 states statewide think tanks which essentially are taking conservative policy proposals generated by Bradley, the Koch Brothers Americans for Prosperity, and their ALEC, American Legislative Exchange Council, taking these proposals, actively translating them into state policies, actively propagand propagandizing for them as statewide think tanks. So why do we need this? Why do we need these reforms? almost always packaging them as bold reforms, so seizing the reform mantle, and then uh, organizing around them. So Americans for Prosperity in Wisconsin, and I'm, I'll stop now, Chris, is a, has essentially become a para-party, not simply a funder of the, of, the, of the conservative Republicans, but they actually have an active para-party organization on the ground with active organizers that has helped pull the Republican Party to the right here, and I know in, in North Carolina, there's a sim in other states too, there's a similar kind of movement. Um, then a, a couple of other notes of continuity. Ryan Priebus is this interesting figure who stands against Trump early on, uh, supporting Cruz, um, uh, uh, and then um, uh, of course goes to the White House for a while. Um, we've, got, we've got some of these questions about to what degree was Walker's plan uh, uh, premeditated. To what degree was Walker seen by the Koch brothers and Bradley Foundation as a potential vehicle for these these messages and ideas, and uh, to in, in terms of seeding them, and to what extent what were some opportunities that arose simply seized upon by Walker's administration and others? Mike's going to talk. Actually. Mike going to talk right now. So um, Mike's going to um, come up and tell us a little more about in terms of the, the messaging and, and media that were used by the Republicans based on some of the data that we've begun to gather. I'll, I'll let you talk. Some qualitative data I'll let you talk about. So uh, Lou and I have spent uh, a little bit of time over the last couple of years talking to a variety of people in Wisconsin about how this happened and what are people's own narratives of how all of this took place. So we've talked to people who are in an elective office in Wisconsin, people who are former elected officials in Wisconsin, uh, people who are editors of newspapers in Wisconsin, people who are newspaper reporters uh, in Wisconsin, um, people who are kind of behind the scenes political operatives, um, some who work just in the executive branch under both governors of both parties. So we have kind of a wide variety of kind of informants that we have been and continue uh, to seek out to kind of understand other explanations of, of how this happened. And so this kind of comes in the context of what you saw yesterday from the Ji-Yoon and Devon's presentation of public opinion data over 40 waves of the, or 42 or whatever it is now, the Marquette Law School poll, the, the, um, the Twitter data you saw where Charlie Sykes, the conservative talk show host in Milwaukee, was the central player in the conservative nodes <laughs> in terms of the power of message dissemination. Um, and then it all, and all of that in the context of the people Kathy talked to uh, that she reflected upon in her book. And so kind of a few, a few themes have started to emerge to us as we've looked at um, some of these, or as we kind of reflect on the conversations we've had with these key informants, and, and one of which is a, is, a, is a media, is a political communication kind of uh, finding that the Republican Party is consciously focused on cultivating local television coverage and ignoring newspaper attention um, it, as it, and it, with the strategic goal of making Madison and Milwaukee the enemy. And so one, one GOP campaign operative who uh, was one of the people behind Ron Johnson's surprising, Ron Johnson led zero polls before he won Wisconsin uh, in uh, his reelection bid. 
um, in, in 2016. So, we, so a person who worked for Johnson and also now is one of the people uh, running a Governor Walker's reelection campaign um, said we can always make a successful argument pitting Madison and Milwaukee versus the rest of the state. Um, we see this a lot in terms of benefits in Milwaukee. In Madison, we see it a lot in terms of the university. Uh, and it's, it's always couched in the kinds of um, ways that Governor Walker talks about that, that Chris referred to. So Governor Walker often will make claims that are, that he kind of couches as bold and common sense. Like, well, isn't it just make sense for faculty to pick up another class? Well, why don't they just do that? And it just sounds reasonable. If they get the summers off, they're only teaching one or two classes a semester, why don't they just pick up another? You know, these kinds of things sound reasonable to a person who's not getting those kinds of benefits. Um, so anyway, t the, the, so we've heard that uh, from a lot of different people, but you know, I think the, the clearest characterization of us, we can always make an argument um, making Madison and Milwaukee versus the rest of the state, and also that we work around newspapers and go straight to local television. Um, there's been a precipitous decline in newspaper circulation uh, across the state, um, and some local papers have folded. Uh, I know the, the, Michael Calderon of Politico is working on the story now, um, looking at papers in three kind of small counties in uh, Wisconsin that folded, and he's looking at, those are also three counties that were like 55 or 60 percent for Obama and then 55 and 60 percent for Trump. So there's a disappearance of local newspaper coverage, a flip in political coverage, and part of what we're hearing from GOP operatives is, by design, we ignore newspapers and get on local television, which I think, I can't remember if it was Chris or June talking about, that's kind of the number one place where Wisconsinites say they get their news. Um, the other thing that's happening is once uh, Walker took office, um, there was a, like, the, the pace at which all of this happened that Chris was talking about was striking and rapid. And we think of the work of government tending to be really, really slow. And then, but this was a punctuation in a punctuated equilibrium. And one uh, insider who worked in uh, for both uh, Governor Tommy Thompson, a Republican, and Governor Jim Doyle, a Democrat, said they, referring to Ryan's previous, it was not a part of Walker's cabinet or county. Just a, it was a kind of important in the Wisconsin Republican Party, and then became head of the RNC. Put it as their pedal to the metal, take no prisoners, and believe they had license to pursue Act Ten because of the divide and conquer strategy. So there's, I think. I can't remember, did Divide and Conquer come out from audio taping of Walker? Yeah, audio or, taping yeah. during the uh, documentary. Yeah, there was but, a direct quote. Yeah, so, yeah. It was aired. Yeah, it's, yeah, so Walker himself saying this is the this is our goal, right, to divide and conquer people, yeah. So the <clears throat> work around newspapers and go straight to local TV, I, I heard you say that the decline of newspapers, if you just wanted the most effective reach, that's one argument for why local TV, but maybe there's other reasons. Are there... Are there other reasons? Yeah, so um, in a separate project uh, that I've been working on, um, I, it's not, not quite related to this, um, I have video from a couple of local television stations of gaggles with the governor, so when reporters surround the governor and ask him questions. And newspaper reporters, by and large, are the only ones who ever ask follow-ups. They're the only ones mm -hmm. who will ask a question if another reporter's question doesn't get answered. So I ask a question to Governor Walker. He stays on message as he's very good at doing. Other television reporters don't ask follow-up. But if a TV reporter asks a question, Walker doesn't answer it. The newspaper reporter asks the follow-up. So, so part of what we're hearing is that you know Walker um, and, and Republicans in general, and probably all politicians, recognize they're going to get less scrutiny from local television reporters than newspaper reporters. And newspaper reporters tend to be centered at the Capitol. They tend to be much more familiar with the inner workings of things. Television reporters are understaffed, and no matter what happens, the news starts at 5, 6, and 10. They have to have stories. They have to find someone to talk to them. They have to find a soundbite to air. And the incentives are different for them than, than the newspaper and reporters. And that's because the medium is different, and they are only looking for sound bites on TV, or there's I'll more of a Sinclair owned TV station. So part, of it, so part of it's the medium. Part of it's the ownership structure of the television stations owned by Sinclair, which Lou, I think, can talk about in, in more detail. Uh, so a bias in ownership. Yeah, part although, of although it, I, would, I would say that's a relatively small yeah. part of it, it's particularly in Wisconsin. It's mostly just, it's a certain local news ecology, mm -hmm. and this has been true for many years, well before these phenomena, where I've, I've been a television station executive producer, so I know, you know, essentially it's, it's relatively hard to put on five, now six, now seven shows a day. All you do is get a sound bite. Yeah. You're not really reporting. The only people who report are newspapers, mm -hmm. I mean, effectively. 
television puts sound bites to what newspaper actually reports on, and that's been true for a long time, which is why it's also popular for many people, because, hey, seven minutes, I get to see the sound bites of, quote, what's going on, and then I can get on to the weather and the sports, which is what I really care about anyway. Well, it's also the case of expertise, <laughs> right? So television reporters who work in the Green Bay market don't come to Madison. So they are not following the inner workings of state government in the same way that the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel, Wisconsin State Journal, and yeah. the Capital Times in Madison are. And so when the governor comes to Green Bay, he's at an information advantage over the television reporter who yesterday was probably covering a, a children's event at a school, and tomorrow will probably cover you know, something else that's not politics. Yeah. And so part of it's an expertise story in terms of reporters too, I think. Yeah. I think two other points that needed to here was, um, on a national basis, local TV news still is the top source of news and is there's a shrinking news hole for local politics. They right. do a lot of feed right. from national and they'll do public interest stories. So the, the hole for local or statewide political coverage is small. Governors have a bully pulpit. If they do something, it becomes, they, they can grab attention in a way that other people can't. And then the other feature of this, and I know you're going to get this on the next slide, is the other thing they actively sought out was talk radio which is also a way to bypass these papers. Right. And I think your archive is particularly important at looking at that question. Exactly. So one slide from now, we'll get to that point. The second uh, major theme uh, that emerged um, was how unprepared the Democrats were for all of this to happen. Um, one person who'd worked in the executive branch under Governor Thompson and Governor Walker for, for a brief time um, said, I don't think they saw this coming. And then when he was saying you, it was kind of the second person you, meaning Republicans. You didn't go after unions if you were Tommy, which is Tommy Thompson, the former Republican governor or Republican governor. But Walker dropped the bomb. We Act, which is a public sector uh, labor union, um, thought it was the same game, meaning the typical battles between Republicans and Democrats. And so a lot of what we've heard, both from reporters and political insiders, is the Democrats just got rolled. They, they weren't prepared for this. They didn't know how to fight. This is why the, the state lawmakers leave the state. They, they don't know what else to do, and so they just prevented a quorum, you know, for, for, for a short period of time, you know. Um, and so, and then the second part of it was more um, on the communication side with respect to the messaging. And so one Democratic lawmaker uh, we talked to who had thought about running for governor but ultimately demurred uh, this cycle was talking about how, so the GOP were visceral. The messages were much more us v them. They were much more um, emotional was kind of the way he would talk about it, whereas the Democrats' messages were, oh, we're for kids, we, you know, we like teachers, kind of much softer messages in his characterization. Um, and I would also say some of the Republican uh, campaign operatives we've talked to have made that same argument, although in a less strident way, not saying visceral, but we can pit Madison versus Milwaukee, you know, th those kinds of arguments are, are similar. And so there's a difference in the framing strategies uh, that we're at least we're hearing about differences in framing strategies used that we can take a look at on social media. Um, we can look at in the newspaper coverage that we're starting to analyze now. And then the kind of the last thing I'll talk about, Chris alluded to this as well, was 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 Act 10 a political plan that was in the works before Governor Walker got elected, or was it political opportunism? What, did did the Republicans get to office and? kind of, you know, had just read John Kingdon and realized, oh, the policy streams are coalescing, we have an opportunity to do something that we, you know, not, not literally reading John Kingdon, right, but, you know, thinking we have an opportunity to do something, um, and so let's take it, or was it something that had been more strategic? And opinions differ on this question in terms of the interviews we've done. And so one Democratic operative had said, you know, their whole strategy is to destroy the party, right, getting at what Chris and, and Lou were talking about a few minutes ago. Um, a reporter in Wisconsin, who incidentally um, is, is one of the most skeptical people I know and is not a conspiracy theorist, um, said, I think there was a meeting of the minds before the 2010 election so that we can reconstitute the upper Midwest, or this upper Midwest haven of progressive history. They, uh, so they here was a conversation about the Bradley Foundation, um, the, the people Chris had talked about and Lou had talked about before, the, kind of the, the money behind some of the more conservative policy experiments that have happened in Wisconsin and, and increasingly in other states. Um, there was a meeting of the minds. They, they, they saw Walker as willing to take the flack to do it. So they, they you know, believed that Governor Walker uh, was ambitious, um, strategic, and relentlessly on message. So kind of the background of that is so Governor Walker uh, was county executive um, and then ran for governor before he was successful, recognized he wasn't going to be 
get through the Republican primary and dropped out very early, which surprised a lot of people in Wisconsin to think, oh, this Milwaukee County executive's quitting early. The same thing happened in the presidential race, right? Walker leapt to a, the, the super early lead after a well-received speech in Iowa, kind of tanks in the debates, but he drops out very, very early, says what we need to do is go after a real conservative candidate, endorses Cruz, but then endorses Trump at the Republican National Convention. So Walker is a, is a part, is, is a Republican. He wants the Republican Party to win and behave strategically in ways to help the party even when he's not personally benefiting, whether it was his first run for governor, his run for president, or his successful runs for governor. Um, and so they, so the, the, so one story from people on the left goes, they saw Walker as kind of this willing participant um, to, to do these sorts of things. Um, but then, as Devon was alluding to a second ago, um, there's also evidence that Governor Walker would regularly meet with talk radio hosts off air to talk about what kinds of messages the governor would promote and how he would frame things, and also what talk radio would discuss. And so, um, so the John Doe emails, there's a, there was a lawsuit in Wisconsin, a couple of lawsuits in Wisconsin um, related to uh, potential scandals when Governor Walker was county executive and were they using government resources for campaign purposes and other kinds of things. Anyway, there's a whole set of emails that were a part of this legal case, and in those emails are discussions between Governor, or then County Executive Walker, but, uh, and also Governor Walker, and Charlie Sykes, the talk radio host, about what kinds of ways, how, how are we going to frame this issue this week, or what's the message of the week, what's the issue of the month, that sort of thing. Um, and so there were discussions of, of strategy. When we interviewed Charlie Sykes, um, he said, I don't know if Act 10 was a larger strategy or not, and he was... Um, expansive on everything we asked him except that. Mm -hmm. I, I think that's a fair characterization of our conversation. Just one yeah. quick note that yeah. Sykes also confirmed that he was talking to Walker yeah. from the very beginning of Walker's political career. Right. Walker would actively seek him out. So Walker yeah. knew that Sykes was a powerful voice in Wisconsin politics well before he became governor and they, they talked multiple times a week and Charlie confirmed that. So this yeah. is not uh, external speculation. That's right. It, Sykes said, uh, this may not be a direct quote but it's the the essence of what he said, which is, um, if you wanted to have a political elite on the radio, Scott Walker would always say yes. He was always willing. He understood, and Sykes also said that Walker understood very quickly the power of that medium to talk to conservative voters, people who were going to show up and vote in primaries, people who were going to be voting in general elections. And Walker understood the kind of flying over the traditional mainstream media before other candidates step in and debunk. So is it fair to say, in, in the same way people observe uh, Trump's use of Twitter as a direct channel, whether it's the local TV yeah, that's or it's the soundbite or it's the talk radio, there's a category of channels of access where you have a relatively unmediated channel out and, and the, the people behind those channels were actively coordinating. Is that, is that a summary? I think, I think TV just became weaker. They were just doing less and talk yeah. radio became the more direct route. I mean, that's the most direct because you just got yeah. the mic, right? Yeah. You got right. the mic and the audience, too. And you have time. Yeah. And it's live, it's not edited, there's no editorial yeah. process, yeah. right? You've got half there's no editorial hour, process. You know. And uh, when, when, this be sorry, when this became known publicly, how did, what was public reaction that Sykes and Walker were in? Not course? really, no. A motivated reasoning. So, so, so those who knew, Democrats would say, aha, I knew it, this is terrible. And Republicans would say, well, why wouldn't they talk about what they want the country to be like? That's perfectly appropriate. It's inside baseball, basically. <laughs> the public doesn't know, and mostly his supporters, of course, don't care. Yeah. So it's kind of. Yeah. I would say, though, like, you know, this is my own, this is not speaking for the group. Like, Twitter is, is a direct conduit if you've got a lot of followers. So for Trump, that's, that's the yeah. filter, right? But if you're Walker, you've got to have talk radio to amplify that message. Although, just quickly. Walker has 216,000 Twitter followers right. in this relatively small state, so we also. But not all of them are in Wisconsin. Yeah, not all in Wisconsin, but it's still a very large Twitter. And his following. rate of retweeting is small. Yeah, it's but but, but Gov on. Governor Walker's tweets are totally different than President Governor Walker's tweets. Literally, are here's another ham. Governor Walker brings two ham sandwiches in a brown paper bag to lunch every day, and regularly tweets about it. <laughs> like yeah. several news organizations have written stories about He's that. It's, it's mostly, you know, this business is coming to Wisconsin, and here's my ham sandwich, and I ride Harley-Davidson's, and I love the Green Bay Packers. Those are the four yeah. things you can call it. Italian. Yeah.
Oh, um, so oh sorry. One other point, I, mean, I think you're kind of hitting on it with the, the, <coughs> the bag lunches and the Harley yeah. Davidson. You know, Scott Walker was not a college graduate. He right. did Drops not out of uh, uh, graduate from Marquette. There's some question as to why he left in his senior year. Uh, uh, but when teachers attacked him and people in the public sector attacked him, like, this guy doesn't even have a college degree. I have to have a college degree to teach your kids, and he doesn't have a college degree. Coupled with the pictures of his bag lunch and him driving his Harley, it all fit this very anti-elitist message, mm -hmm. right? When they were attacking him for not having a college degree, well, a good chunk of the state doesn't have a college degree. Mm -hmm. And you know, when you attack him on that basis, go, that makes him illegitimate. Everyone who doesn't have the college degree goes, well, screw you, I don't have one either. I'm voting for this guy. And I think all of that, I mean, he's, he, there is a calculation he's to smart. this he's about smart. the kind of image that's being constructed, right? We're talking about this with Trump. Like Trump's more instinctual. I think Walker's very calculated. And it's also the case. Like I think this came up. And I think this is actually your critique at the end of the day, Devon. Was what a populist done? <laughs> What's the populist success rate when you get elected? Walker has an extraordinary success rate. He does. Um, and a lot. So the the union stuff, but also the next kind of round of things that he's sort of starting to push are um, kind of two year degrees, right? So don't go to college. Get a get a trade degree. Help. Pr help work in the businesses that support the party, that sort of thing. And so it's it's a multi-layered strategy, but it's also been a much more successful one from a policy perspective. Trump's limited successes are in executive <laughs> orders that are in legal limbo. Yeah? Um, I was actually going to bring up the point, too, about he doesn't have a college degree, and how much of this is personality-driven or person-driven? Mm -hmm. That's a great so question. Yeah. phenomena that we're talking about, there are people, like, mm -hmm. I think you put up the charts then if you're all the people. Yeah. And I just, I wonder if we're not thinking about that enough in all of these movements. I, I agree with you completely because I yeah. think the Republican Party, I don't think the Republican Party is a populist party. I think Trump is a populist candidate. Yeah. Right? Like, right. this is the thing that I'm kind of curious about. Like, do we start to distinguish the particular cult of personality figures who occupy that role versus parties that take on the broad mantle or when certain kinds of people can hostily take over our party, which is what Trump has now done the Republican Party. Well, like a weird outcome that's affected the media ecology in Wisconsin is so Scott Walker and Ted, or Scott Walker and Charlie Sykes and the Republican apparatus in Wisconsin say, Ted Cruz is our guy. Ted Cruz wins the Wisconsin primary. When Trump becomes the nominee, most talk radio hosts around the state Mark Belling, the most powerful besides Sykes, Vicki McKenna as well, fall in line. We are for Trump. Hillary Clinton must be stopped at all costs. Right? This is ne negative partisanship at, at a minimum and pro-Trump you know, at a maximum. Sykes stays anti-Trump, stays never Trump, ne and is no longer a talk show host in Wisconsin, the most powerful, most popular for decades, no longer a talk show host in Wisconsin. Said he was going to plan to retire anyway. Maybe he did. You know, it's hard to know. Middle of the road thing now, so now, so so so, 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 yeah. he, he's, he, he wrote a book called How the Right Lost Its Mind. Yeah. He's a regular contributor on MSNBC, which we would not have predicted two <laughs> years ago, right? Um, but he's still, but he's still a, a, a Republican in the Ronald Reagan sense of being a Republican. He's, he has not come to the left. He has not moderated. He just says, Trump is terrible. Here are all the ways <coughs> Trump is terrible. Yeah. Julia. So I think. Thinking about the relationship between, so thinking about the question of populist success, and think about the, this kind of goes back to what I was trying to get to yesterday with the relationship between populism and conservatism. When you say that Walker has a lot of deliverables that he, you know, he's been successful on, those are not, they have like a populist message around them about ham sandwiches and yeah. two-year degrees. But well, Walker sent his own two kids to the- To students. here, I taught one of his sons. Yeah. yeah, I taught his other son in Marquette. <laughs> yeah. So the two more elite institutions that, in Wisconsin, yeah. um, but the agenda is the agenda is just the oh straight yeah, it's the Republican yeah. agenda. And that's, I think that's right. Yeah, but I think if we just say, well, this is a this is a contradiction or this is a, a lie or whatever, that we're losing something about the relationship yeah. between those two things. No, that's fascinating. That's, yeah. I don't think it's a lie. I mean, you have that in Europe a lot mm -hmm. that you have populist leaders that have no experience yeah. in politics. And, and I, actually, we sometimes call it the populism paradox, you know, because um, it's, it's kind of strange that you have some economic leaders like Berlusconi, billionaires, you know, and they become popular, but they are actually part of the elite, you know? Mm -hmm. So, but I asked uh, Kasmuda about that um, 
some of you may know him. And I said, it's actually, how can you explain? Mm -hmm. and, and he said, they pitch themselves as being untainted by the political system. Right, right. which Trump did too. That is, that is what their trick is. I'm successful and I believe, right. but I'm not part of the political system, you know? And I think that is, that is really interesting. And I think that, that Walker is a bit different because, that's different. Right. because yeah. he, in a certain way, he always said, I'm not part of I'm a Republican. Of, of academia, you know? Well, I'm out of that, so yeah. for sure. So, yeah. so that, that's a, yeah. Bit, yeah. a bit different, but I think it's, yeah. a, it's the same, yeah. same story below. Of yeah, no, I think that, that's fascinating. Yeah. Uh, I think this goes back to oh, what sorry, sure. some of us were saying yesterday, that if you follow some of the rhetoric as a way to determine the populism, then you get into a slippery slope. And I think that's a better ground, say, you know, a non-populist would have had the same agenda and the same results than somebody who sounds like a populist, but deep down, is really like, you know, a Republican, you know. Um, so that's why it seems to me it's that that's what we're talking about here, that from what you are reporting back, yeah. it doesn't look like a populist. I mean, really, yeah. you know. The, the policies are just Republican. Exactly policies. that, right. The credit claiming is populist. Right. You know, like the, 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 the communication. Yeah, yeah, that's what I mean, yeah. 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 But his <laughs> acts are too. I mean, I mean, Act 10 is actually a populist act. Yeah, I agree. It's illiberal. It's a, it's a kind of a liberal act. No, it's not. I mean, it's, Why is it I mean, right? It's not a liberal. Because in a certain way, it's against plural. I mean, it's, I mean, union. If you attack the union, that is kind of an attack on on, on the plural. So it's that it's all Republicans. It's, 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 yeah. it's, yeah. it's, yeah. it's, it's a liberal act. Find. It is a liberal in a very specific sense, and I think it's important to understand. And I realize some people say, "Well, he got elected, and he he attacked the unions who were." supporting the Democratic Party, who was his enemy. What's wrong with that? And it's true. You know, you could say it's quid pro quo politics. He never said, there was no, two, two things. There was no platform, no pre, he didn't say, I'm, if I'm elected, I'm going to, you know, pass an act that will, that will take benefits away from public workers. He might not have gotten elected if he did, because he got support from a lot of public workers in the out parts of the state. And then he used that as a mechanism to destroy the power of the Democratic Party. And that's, I think, a very important, that's where it becomes a liberal. Exactly. So he, point, which is he didn't get elected, he didn't use the rhetoric of populism being elected. Instead, once he got into power, he did the bidding of the oligarchs. Well, he, right? he, he, essentially, he, he essentially went with the, the power structures that were. I'm saying that's, that's, why, that's why it's illiberal. Because he did use that power. It's not necessarily populist. No, it's not. Can, we, can, Sylvia, can you define for us, though, what you would count as a populist or non populist policy? Is right. The way? question is, you know, fundamentally op opposition sort of undermining some of the basic structures that you have in a liberal democracy. That's what it means to me. Because if you go into the rhetoric <laughs> as sort of the, the best predictor of what populism is, mm -hmm. then you get into all com kind of complicated issues. Just because we divide us versus, versus them, it's not, but if in effect in politics, you say us versus them, and I'm gonna kill them, I'm gonna make sure that they are completely destroyed, then that bursts into illiberalism, right? So, so, so that's why, I mean, we have to keep in mind that the words of the action, we always have to keep in mind, instead of this bifocal view, in order to determine whether or not someone is an ax like a populist, but if someone is and acts like, you know, what mainstream conservatism will basically do. And I'm sure has been waiting for a while. So, I mean, I think this is a great illustration of why you shouldn't use policies to describe populism, right? So, in the U.S., the us versus them, the resentment is often generated against public sector workers, people who seem to have these special benefits. This would not resonate the same in Europe, right? There, the people who are getting benefits that are not deserved are immigrants or refugees, right? Everybody wants to have those benefits. There's not the same anti-statist ideology in Europe that there is here. And so if we look at the policies, then this whole populism thing becomes impossible to use as a cross-national moniker, right? The us versus them is key. That's the illiberal part, right? Who the us is and who the them are, that's going to vary from country to country. So as you've discussed, as Kathy has written about, in Wisconsin and in many parts of the United States, the resentment is against people who seem to have benefits that are not earned, right? Or who have jobs that have security without merit, right? This is very resonant in the United States. It's not gonna work in Europe, right? There, the sort of the cleavage that you're gonna motivate around is gonna be very different, and the policies that are gonna follow from that are different. So 
very popular in Europe to have welfare state nativism. That just doesn't work as well in the United States, right? And so if we focus on the policies to define who is populist and who's not, we're, we're just not going to go very far. I think what's clear here is this, as you said, this kind of us versus them, you know, rallying around resentment, the anti-elitism, the sort of, you know, not manichaeism of the whole political process. That, I think, very much crosses boundaries. You get that in Latin America, too, obviously, right? So, you know, the policies are going to vary based on the context, the history, blah, 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 blah. But, you know, this is, this is pretty so classic Sherry, otherwise. Yesterday you gave us two core requirements. The other was to subvert or work around the institutions. And the, the establishment, yes. I would and say, is a general thing. So yeah. the, would you apply that in this case? Yeah, absolutely. And this is what, you know, Cass was saying, right, which is that, you know, we are not part of that establishment. We are not going to work within it. We are not of it, and we're going to either subvert or work around it. So what's, a, what's a specific thing that Walker did that means Well, that he says he's not from the South, and he wants to destroy all of it, and he's willing to do things that, you know, again, subvert many of the typical processes. Like, some of the I things we were talking I'm about like, before, I didn't even, I mean, I wasn't aware of, right? Like, so, you know, firing people from internships and subverting one, the legal process, that kind that of thing. One is, but, but that's still the legal Walker. process. The governor appoints the Board of Regents, and so we Walker. can... Well, yeah. okay, I mean, I, I don't know. The that's... Milwaukee Journal Sentinel is doing that. We had students who had internships at the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel, and when they found out that they had signed the petition, uh, their internship was... Yeah, that wasn't Walker uh, subverting them. Uh, but, but most of what yeah, Walker's done has been within the legislative there, process. There, yeah, it's, it's not been outside there behind the scenes, right? That's not typically the way the American democratic process is thought to have worked, right? I mean... You're not supposed to do not that. Publicly. I mean, if that's being coordinated by Walker, that's that's the first thing I've heard, which would be an example of Sherry second. Well, it could just be, well, we want to keep though. favor with the governor, so we're going to make clear that we're not going to tolerate any, you know, sort of public, um, you know, kind of statements. So that's that's emergent. That's just just to be emergent. Yeah. Should, should, yeah. Yeah. I, we should be really clear. Yeah. It was it was the Journal Sentinel applying a set of traditional journalistic yeah. ethics and norms. Right. It was oh. not. So it, was, it had nothing to do with Walker's yeah, interference. It's saying, like you're taking a stand on a political issue that's stand taking, and it's for stand taking. Incredibly scared of being pinned as liberal. Then it seems. So it wasn't political retribution. It was a political. For the student board of regents kid, it was. For the student board of regents kid. Then it appears to me if we if we were to accept Sherry's two core defining requirements, I don't see evidence of the second. Just apply. That definition of populism, no Walker, is that in yeah. discourse or in action? Because, in action. Because yeah, but I, I don't think that it's necessary to have an action. If you look at the discourse, you can see that that he has this distinction between the folks in Wisconsin and Washington. You know, that's the difference. It's like us. Just, of the, but, but he's not. Democrats have used that for decades. Well, he's Democrats do too. I mean, yeah. every candidate who runs for office does this. They say, you know what? I'm going to take Wisconsin values to Washington. I mean, everybody <laughs> does that, right? That, that's not a partisan thing, right? So vote Wagner in 2020. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just have a lot of trouble in this conversation um, either seeing populism as everything or as nothing. Exactly. And I'm yeah, having yeah. trouble yeah. figuring out what the middle ground is from the criteria that people have put forward, to be honest. <laughs> That's a great suggestion for a session for the afternoon. Yeah, yeah. yeah. exactly. That should be an unconference topic, I think. Yeah. Well, because here at least, what are the boundary conditions of yeah. What I'm hearing is that it really is a question about discourse, or it's a question about policy, or it's a question about, let's say, specific attitudes and policies related to basic democratic liberal institutions. Right. And that's different from policy. Yeah. And those are three elements that can, and I think this is the source of the confusion, or not confusion, but those three elements can operate independently. You can have, you can have populist discourse, but conservative yeah. traditional policies. That happens a lot. That's, that's actually traditional. Ronald Reagan did that in a lot of ways. You can have populist discourse and uh, rep extremely conservative policies that are bordering on our liberalism, but are sort of within the rules of the game. And then you can have, as I believe we did, it's an argument, populist discourse, a, actually there's a certain amount of sleight of hand here, and I think that that's what muddies this, because the hardcore, I mean, Walker certainly do not run in, I'm gonna, on the platform, I'm gonna dismantle the, I'm gonna destroy the teachers union, which is gonna destroy the Democratic Party. Yeah, that wasn't he, in a commercial. He was very self, <laughs> they were very aware of it, 
right? It, they knew they knew very clearly that if we get WEAC, which is the teachers union, we've wiped out the core base of the Democratic Party in this state for at least ten years. And so they did it, and that's in the liberal act because it was a, it was an act of changing of the rules of the Democratic game through political manipulation, and you can trace it back to admiration for what Daniels was trying to do in Indiana, right? I mean, explicitly. So, so this isn't just kind of, I want to be really clear, connect the dots speculation. I mean, there's, there, there is a core here that said, we really want to get rid of the unions, because if we get rid of the unions, we destroy Democratic Party power. And then we can take some then we can take it to the welfare state. Too. So there's probably a distinction to be made between illiberal acts that are political, but not a for lack of a better phrase in the moment, a constitutional part of the system. Like labor unions are you know, beating up the labor unions is I, I'm a great politician if I defeat my enemy, right? Yeah. Versus what Deb is talking about, which is you know the governor by policy changing something in an illiberal way. So there's probably some kind of distinction there. Karen Lita's had her hand up for a long time, so I wanna and then uh, Well I I'm kind of wondering why you are so much into the actions, because the problem with me and the the defending the problem we go to the question that Dalak asked yesterday. So what do you do when they succeed? Right? Because if we if we look only into the interaction of what is the outcome of the policy, it means that we cannot talk about the populist parties if they did not succeed succeeded in the government. Or if they did not succeed in their in their electoral game. Right? Because being populist in, I mean as we are now in the stage of populism, it's not that they are governing everywhere. Right, or there will not be success. There are some countries where they got success, right? But yesterday, the one was saying, so Trump is a populist, but then his policy is not populistic. So is he still a populist? Yeah. So, I think, the, so I, I think the question on the middle ground is like, it's it's absolutely fantastic question because yeah. how far we have to go into the policy issues and how much rhetoric is really important. And or, or Walker did the opposite. Didn't really run on a populist no, he, the first yeah. time, but then came in and, and tried to execute more of a populist platform. Which Republicans might say about FDR, who didn't campaign on the New yeah. Deal, but then and, and did it very quickly. Just on the whole petition <laughs> signing thing, um, there was all the named petition signers were released by the Attorney General's office. There was concerns about backlash against people who signed the petition. And ultimately, this led to the sanction of over 25 journalists from Gannett newspapers, especially in outstate parts of Wisconsin, who had signed the petitions, were seen as, oh, that's a political act. The journalist said, hey, it was like voting to me. I'm allowed to vote, right? But no, it was made public who they voted for, it and that it, so it became very political, the release of the recall signatures and who signed to recall Walker. But not because Walker struck back at them. It was well, and that's the question, which is where was that organized? I think the whole question about the release by the Attorney General, if you read the stories about it, but the question was, was this done to precipitate reactions against the people who signed? State workers, others like that. Is it standard to release stuff like that, Julie? It's public record. I'm not sure if it's standard to say, here, here's our... Here's our announcement that we're releasing it, but it's certainly publicly available. Yeah, states, it's public. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. yeah. And if, if somebody writes for a journalist, they know that signing petitions is like number one. It's revenue contributions. Yeah. As a thing you don't do. Can't do. You were yeah. told at 538 not to sign petitions to get people on the ballot. Like, just don't mess with petitions. Yeah. So that's not yeah. outside. And I don't think having it public is outside norms yeah. either, but if there was a fight to make it public, <laughs> So um, I know people have lots of other things to say, and the next <laughs> part of what we want to do is to hear you say them. But I'll I still combine the next two parts, which is you and Chris both discuss the theme for us, wrangle concepts, and maybe as we move into lunch, so maybe we take half hour. Yeah, but, I, I want, I, but I'd love to be able to kind of focus a conversation about the next thing that Chris is going to talk about, which is sort of a brief description of what we have and a brief solicitation of what we want with respect to help from you, which I think Well, I think I think the big question is with all these questions percolating, we have a case to, at, to ask those questions. So we'd love to have your input on how do we most productively turn all these questions that are percolating into research, not only research questions which we have, but sort of research opportunities. So I want to tell you a little bit about the data that we have. It's overwhelming. I know it'll be overwhelming to you. It's overwhelming to us every, every Friday. Um, so um, but let me just give you a sense of the breadth and scope and depth and everything. 
So um, you know about Kathy's Citizen Political Talk work, so her book really describes the way people are talking in these communities. Um, we have that on a couple levels. We have Kathy's own analysis of it. We also have the text itself, which Deb has been doing some things with, and we've also been doing some things with, um, I think with the goal of trying to identify uh, lexical or semantic uh, units of meaning that we can then trace across different parts of the media ecosystem. So can we trace the way that people talk when they talk to Kathy and communities or other forms of interpersonal talk? Can we connect those to themes that are being used by Walker? The way that he is talking about public workers or the difference between Madison and Milwaukee or other themes. Can we connect those to, to the way that news media is covering the same topics? How is news media in, the, in Milwaukee, for example, the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel, talking about key issues and themes as compared to outstate newspapers? How are, how are the same things being talked about on social media, which we now can map to some extent geographically? How are people in the Northwest talking about something uh, and so forth? Talk radio. Again, uh, to, in, in what ways, I think we just raised the question, in what ways does talk radio provide a, a channel for specific frames and ideas to flow from Walker or the talk radio host themselves, or maybe one step removed, the Bradley Foundation or Americans for Prosperity through talk radio to communities and interpersonal talk. Um, one way that we can look at outcomes of this is by looking at the public opinion data that ji Yoon and Devon gave you some glimpses of before. In essence, we have monthly or better data regularly asking questions. They're mostly top-line questions. Unfortunately, we don't have a lot of richness when it comes to communication variables, but we know a lot about people's views on a few big topics like immigration and healthcare and certainly major political figures like the, the current president, uh, other national figures, Walker himself, and so on. Charles, that's, we should credit Charles. That's Charles's Marquette, uh, Charles, Charles, Charles Franklin's, Charles Franklin's uh, Marquette University Law School poll. Is that those 42 waves, uh, is that from a panel? No, 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 no. it's a rolling cross section, so it's new cross sections every time. 700 uh, 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 registered voters, so it's not even a, it's specific not to a cross section of the population, but a cross section of registered voters. And it's very representative of registered voters. So th it gives us a couple of things. As you saw, when June and Devon pooled it, we can get fairly fine gradations of difference across the state. We can break up by county, for example, for the most part. Or we can look at it uh, uh, over time, although when we do that, we can't look at small counties. Um, you just heard about political and media elites, some of the work that Mike and Lou are heading up and talking to uh, the Charlie Sykeses and, and political operatives. Um, we have a lot of uh, government performance data. We actually haven't done so much with this. We're also working with some ad tracking data. And finally, we've got a, a, a large amount of sociographic uh, and economic data. So uh, some fine gradations in terms of unemployment rates, in terms of industries in different counties, in ter certainly in terms of demographic makeup, which in most of Wisconsin isn't, isn't all that interesting. Um, well, because it's mostly white and we don't have it. <laughs> <laughs> white people can be interesting too, Chris. Yeah. So, so talk yourself. radio says podcasts. Are you distinguishing yeah. that from just... Yeah, we, we, can't, we can't harvest what has been on the radio. We could, but the, uh, the, they, a lot of hosts archive podcasts where they hit the major themes of their day, so that's, that's what we could get. That's actually the, the hardest data that we've to yeah. gather because it's, it's gone. And we've even spent quite a bit of time contacting stations to try to get old archives. And they seem not to have them. Uh, or, but which might, I mean, some of these guys are on the air three hours a day every day. So it's possible. I mean, it seems impossible that people don't record it in this day and age. But They record, but they nuke it on a, I mean, that's a standard practice in broadcasting. You know, you keep it for a month or whatever it is. Now that the FCC doesn't enforce anything, nobody cares anymore. You used to have to keep it for license defense, but nobody's worried about their license, so get rid of it. And is YouTube a factor? Uh, do you care about <coughs> Kathy sent us a whole list of YouTube channels yeah. that we've started ingesting that are all local Wisconsin. I, I just don't see that. Did, did we compile that? I don't know if we compiled that. Do we care about it? Yes. Have we put it together? No. So yeah, that's I a really interesting we, we, we talked to Kerry. Yeah, Kerry created, created, oh, Kerry oh, created that list. We, we've actually, that's great. And, and we actually pulled, uh, we hit the YouTube 
Oh, that's uh, API, and it turns out most of it is already transcribed, so we have full transcripts. So are you transcribing? Are you actually pulling the, uh, the the comments underneath the videos as well, or just the videos themselves? Yeah, we you should pull the comments. Yeah, that's there's usually like, there's a nice tool called <laughs> TubeKit by Sean, <Shirley laughs> who's at uh, I think at Rutgers, where you can pull the videos and the accompanying. I'm sure it'd be easy for you guys to do. Yeah. So I'll close with a, a few questions. These are, I mean, I think these are almost all already redundant given the conversations that we've had, but a few things that we're thinking about. Um, and, and I think they do actually point in some other directions. So we've been talking a lot in here about populism in terms of the actions, either the rhetoric or the policy of leaders. And we don't want to lose sight of this point, which Lou brought up this morning, which is that there's a broader crisis of democracy going on. Um, what we've described is the breakdown of these integrated, me integrated mechanisms within societies. So we're trying to ask ourselves, how do we trace the, the causes and, and of, of the, these in integrated mechanism breakdowns? Um, especially, how do we connect a changing communication ecology to political outcomes? Here we're hoping to use the data that we have from various pieces of the communication ecology um, to outcomes that we might be able to track in the public opinion data. So there we might look at things like polarization. How do people feel about other groups? How do they feel about the leaders of other groups? Uh, and so forth. Voting behavior, civic engagement, sort of our classic measures of uh, the way that people participate in politics. We're thinking about this in terms of how do we, um, uh, how, you know, how do we trace a communication ecology's fragmentation? How do we, ch how do we trace differential behavior in different parts of the communication ecology? For example, can we, can we show that different parts of the ecology are uh, uh, promoting different kinds of topics or different frames within those topics? And then how can we connect that to the behavior of audiences that may or may not be tuned into a particular piece of that communication ecology? Um, Relatedly, how do we so how do we study flow through this this fragmented community ecology? This is everything that I just described, um, and then it's really our overarching question: How do we study the relationships between political geographies, communication networks, and interpenetrated communication ecologies today? Which was really the question that I opened with um, yesterday. So we're excited to have your your feedback and input on these questions and to continue the overall conversation. Um, thanks for your attention. Sure, why don't we take a couple and then we'll move on. Well, yeah, go ahead, Dev. Yeah. Go ahead, so, Dev. I'm just wondering if there's more specific research questions. Like, uh, uh, these are very, these are general. Some of these are methodological. And then mm -hmm. the maybe the last bullet is loaded. Like, there's all sorts of relationships. But for example, yeah. um, we are looking at trying to quantify agenda setting in a conversation. Mm -hmm. How much is the talk radio show host setting the agenda for even when people call in, or we're also doing that with Kathy's interviews. Oh, so great. The first sanity check was, is Kathy accidentally setting the agenda more than she thinks she is? Yeah. You know, it does not look like that at all. And, um, but are there specific kinds of, uh, or when you're saying you want to study the flow, that's such an enormous, I mean, it's all loopy, there's, it's all feedback loops, yeah. right? But is there specific events or class of events that you have in mind, like whether it's a protest <coughs> or the passing of a bill or what have you. Yeah. A anything more granular, or are you still in the totally yes. exploratory phase? Uh, Shane, I'll answer this. So, um, uh, I'll tell you about the approach, the approaches that we're taking so far. So, one of the things that we're really focusing on is, um, can we identify the subframes that different groups of people use to talk about a common object? So, in this case, we're framing it largely in terms of themes and subthemes. So we will we'll take a topic like healthcare, for example, which, as I showed you, was one of the top topics that people in Kathy's groups talk about. So when people talk about healthcare, we know from our lexical analyses that there's a few major things that often are part of what they talk about. For example, they talk about the state. They talk about how can the state provide healthcare. And the approach that we're taking so far is when we, we, we look at something at that level, when people talk about the state providing health care, what, what are the frames that they use to mobilize their arguments? And so then we, we identify specific frames. So one of those frames is the state has an obligation to provide health care. Kids should be covered by the state. This is something we should be doing. Another is 
the state struggles to provide healthcare efficiently. The state isn't a good provider of healthcare. So we're trying to establish these frames uh, within these topics so that we can say, everybody's talking about healthcare, but these guys are making these kinds of arguments and these guys are making these kinds of arguments and so forth. And our goal would be to identify the types of arguments that Walker, for example, is most mobilizing around themes like healthcare or uh, the collective bargaining process or something like that, and then identify where are those frames occurring? Where has Walker successfully framed the issue of healthcare or collective bargaining? Can we identify it in talk radio? Can we identify it in news media? Can we identify it in social media? Can we identify it in communities around Wisconsin? And so your end goal in that would be a descriptive study of what you find, that kind of mapping? And no, a beginning goal I think would be a, a mapping. Um, but I think we would try to go from there to something along, we've been using a lot of time series analysis to, uh, to uh, try to try, try to account for some of those loops in terms of autoregressive processes to say that, um, for example, we see an increase in, well, the obvious one would be, how does public opinion change as the discourse within a particular set of media changes? And causal drivers, I, I, Yeah, I you know how anxious, oil, right? so, yeah. you know how anxious we get about the idea of cause, but yeah. So, I guess to sort of follow up, is the ultimate goal to kind of figure out how agenda setting happens? Right, so how public perceptions change, how support for policies are built, how understanding of different issues, healthcare, let's say, evolves over time. That's the kind of I would say, goal. especially the latter, yeah. Okay. So I know we debated this internally. Did we keep the meso and macro social predictions that we had talked about in this presentation? Uh, meso and macro social predictions. Oh, the yes, right here. There. So I mean, I think the <laughs> 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 they're driving this. I think are kind of worth kind of having you guys zero in on because these are our expectations, right? These are what we pr we produced a large grant that we are so we've submitted to an internal competition. We're now going to shop it to places like Carnegie and others, and we'd love to talk to you guys about that as well. But there's a set of predictions, both at the macro social. If you want to flip to the next slide, really quickly. Yeah. Well, should we just let's just highlight these sure. really quick. So the first one is, is really about polarization. So can we identify the ways in which our ecology, the communication ecology, has polarized, or to what extent has it polarized into distinct um, echo chambers? Um, and then uh, secondly, so the um, trying to connect the the county level uh, differences in terms of partisan, socioeconomic, to some extent racial and ethnic makeup are, are shaping this. So what's, what are the linkages between the communication ecology, polarization, and socioeconomic dimensions of polarization and difference? We have county level indicators in all those features, right? We showed you the socioeconomic, but we have racial and ethnic. We also have things like the voting pattern by county. Poverty rate, rate education. Exactly. Health data. Yeah. Oh, yeah, health data too. Public health data. And our second set of predictions is really about the role of homophily as it is manifested in, in different ways. So, you might have socioeconomic dynamics of homophily and also communicative ones. What happens when you layer these on top of one another? Do you get magnification effects, for example, when somebody encounters a relatively homogeneous life world within their county and then also is mostly encountering streams of fairly self-reinforcing uh, um, uh, messages? Um, or do you, and do you get something different if somebody's in a very diverse place uh, and also experiences diverse messages versus being in a diverse place while experiencing relatively concordant messages? Do we not know the answers to these questions? I mean, don't we? I don't think we not do, really. not necessarily. No. no. I mean, isn't this like basic Putnam kind of stuff and before? Like cross cutting, Barshney, all this kind of stuff? Cross cutting well, cleavages versus non cross cutting? No? Putnam, Putnam essentially. In the in the Skita, the 2007 work claims to have uh, resolved this, but all they did is descriptively map some of this. But effectively, there's, we a don't huge, there's a huge amount of work on you know sort of bridging versus reinforcing. But mainly in relation to society. participation, but mainly That's in relation true. to participation, not in relation to social and institutional trust, not in relation to polarization, uh, political delegitimacy, all these other questions. I think in the wake of Putnam's media declines participation, those other questions got lost. I mean, there are people like Talia and 
Daniel has been picking that up and saying, look, we need to be looking more at. There's a huge amount of data on trust in Europe. There's a whole institute at Gothenburg that measures these things. Yeah. Um, so there is some, I don't know about the American context, but I know there's a lot of stuff in Europe. Well, we should be building on that. But in, in terms of the communication, I think Talia's presentation really points to yeah. what we don't know about, yeah. like, you might be getting cross-cutting information, but if you're also getting the uh, concordant information, it might not matter. Yeah. And I think, I mean, some ways, um, two comments. First one is that this hypothesis, in some ways, are the way to answer the questions that you pose to us. Mm -hmm. The questions that you pose to us are more theoretical questions, mm -hmm. in my mind. This hypothesis about the case study, the very rich case study that you presented, will be a way of addressing those questions. So that will be my answer to you. I mean, if you answer this, you have plenty of ideas to answer the more theoretical questions in the previous slides. Mm -hmm. And second, related to H4, my sense is that what we don't know much, I mean, much of the evidence and the arguments about it explains H1 through H3. We don't know what will, will drive people and the individuals in very cross-cutting communication to actually do it. What will sort of go against the tide or against what the evidence about it, the identity politics and everything else that, that we know, what in some ways we can call, and I use this word carefully, quote unquote positive deviance, in which mm -hmm. sort of they back the social norm that you stick with your own or homophobia and everything else. That seems to me that what we don't know very well mm -hmm. from group communication, from health communication, polycom, I mean all kinds of literature mm -hmm. that has studies examples like this, that yes, you can have positive outcomes, but it, at least my interpretation of that literature is not clear why people will be driven outside of the experiment, mm -hmm. let's say, to actually engage with others in ways that they will listen to others, you know, engage in civil conversation, yeah. so on and so forth. That is sort of the trove of the information seems to me that is necessary to answer part of the questions related to what Lou started as this morning, which yeah. is how you rebuild, if in fact it is about that, some kind of, you know, civility or, you know, whatever you want to call it. Yeah, that's a great point. Sven and then Doug. Um, I think what is really interesting about your project is actually, for me, it's the, the dependent variable. Because, I mean, there are a lot of drivers and, and things that could influence, but actually, I think the interesting thing is we don't know exactly what the problem is. I mean, mm -hmm. um, what you said with your first question to us, mm -hmm. what is that, that the problem of social cohesion or yeah. something like that? Yeah. And at the moment in Germany, um, the German government issued a call for an institute of social cohesion. Hmm. And it's worth 30 million uh, euros. Well, we should apply. So it's not, <laughs> I mean, it's quite a lot. Oh. So there, a lot of Germans in Wisconsin. There is an important... <laughs> There is really an important discussion about what social cohesion is. Is there something like social cohesion? Do we need that? And yeah. and I think that is, that is really interesting because, I mean, of course, distrust and stuff like that that is part of it. But but ha that has been researched before. Mm. And I think that your your the, the interesting point about your study is is there is there really like what kind of polarization is taking place mm. between these different structures and how can we measure that and i think that is really really interesting uh, so i just wanted to highlight that thank you that's another great point uh, i think dad had his hand here yeah. i was going to say I, I, I totally agree that there's something very uh there's a path to interventions depending on what you learn mm -hmm. from h4 in particular so it, i mean just really resonates for me as well and i wonder what in, in terms of things already known, that maybe you need to further tighten the kind of cross-cutting communication flows, mm -hmm. because I, I don't know, maybe that's a, a well-understood term in this room, but for me, I, I know, I'm just thinking about like Cass Sunstein studies, <coughs> where depending on the style of the cross-cutting communications, it can either polarize mm -hmm. or depolarize. Mm -hmm. And the more you can tighten that, and then actually search within that ocean of data yeah. that you showed us. And by the way, I, I think a big missing one, I know it's tricky, is Facebook. Mm. Um, but uh, to understand, uh, if, you can, if you can map out where those specific kinds of cross-cutting communications are happening, yeah. um, but that requires tightening the definition. That's just sort of my sense. Great, that. thanks. Yeah, Talia, and then that's over. Yeah, just building on this, I would also, um, push you to keep thinking on H4, and you may have already done this, 
but you're undoubtedly going to find heterogeneity if the literature debate is going to be believed between these outcomes yeah, and being in cross-cutting cross communication flows or discordant social context. And so what I think would be so productive is to hypothesize in advance, and again, you may have already done this, what are the factors that would explain that heterogeneity? So are people in a relatively small community that's heterogene heterogeneous willing to say, like, oh, I kind of trust this, and I see the other side, and once it gets big, that's where you see major cleavages. Mm -hmm. So I think that there are um, geographic components to this that could explain some of the heterogeneity that you can get at in your data that would be really interesting to see. That's right. Yeah. And it also goes to your point earlier where you, you know, the question of even when we encounter cross cutting information, for some of us, that's retrenchment. Yeah, of course. We see it and we don't actually go, oh, I'm, now I'm exposed to difference. I'm going to be more understanding. Because <laughs> it's more fuel for why I believe what I believe. There's an enemy. I've got to make sure I've got my just trying to distinguish what the nature of the cross cutting experience is, yeah. whether it actually produces any kind of democratically deliberative moment, or is it something that actually recoils from that? Yeah, well, they, and I the, tried to highlight that in my presentation. Yeah, you're not surprised really what we don't know. Yeah. 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 The, sometimes right. it polarizes. Huge question. Right. Yeah, one of the biggest problems, and this goes to things that um, the last four people <laughs> addressed, is, is that this is a network phenomenon. Social cohesion is, in its structural level, a network phenomenon. What kind of networks are people embedded in, in their social lives? How are those networks more or less heterogeneous or homophilous? How do those interact with online networks, which I think largely are, at least in Facebook, are largely likely to reflect the structure of those socially embedded place-based networks? Although that's an open question. Facebook is a, a, it's the black box here, right? Because we don't actually know, at least I, I don't believe we know. Maybe others do. And so how to model those networks is a, it's a classic problem in sociology, right? And we don't have good answers yet because Sometimes we default to online networks because, Twitter networks especially, because, hey, we can see networks in Twitter, so therefore we extrapolate from Twitter networks to these underlying networks that generate social cohesion. The same thing with Putnam's work, right? Putnam's work actually was community-based, but it was sort of supra-network level work. So that's, I think, the, one of the hardest empirical layers to both to, to find data on, to model, and address without doing sort of you know either intensive community-based network studies, which nobody does anymore because they're so expensive and difficult. So I, I don't I don't have an answer to that, but I think it's a it's the sort of switching point for a lot of this discussion. So yeah, yeah. Let's see if I can say this clearly. Um, part of the problem I see, I'm just a side note. What I'm trying to figure out in, in, in a project that I'm starting to do right now is on backlash against sort of human rights movements in, in Latin America. So on this, the question is the backlash is related to, you can have quote unquote cross communication if by communication you understand exposure to ideas, which is different from engaging in dialogue or mm -hmm. interaction. Mm -hmm. Because communication is so you know, semantically ambiguous, then you have to break it down. So exposure might result in a backlash, meaning Cross-cutting communication assumes that we live in echo chambers, and that's what we need to question. What do we mean by that? If it is exposure to people who are not like us, or ideas that we disagree with, maybe we are exposed to, but not necessarily we engage the kind of deliberation or dialogue. Second is that we have some literature on cross-cutting communication that basically takes exposure to sort of the whole parasocial exposure to different narratives that present us with, with others, shows that, we, that it may have some positive consequences, yet there is a different strand of literature showing that actually it may have backlash. So when we go to H4, it seems to me that you need to be probably more nuanced what you mean by cross-cutting communication, yes, because communication can be exposure, or can be engagement with others in small groups, or you know, in everyday settings, so. Um, yeah. Great, uh, Daniel and then Sherry. Yeah, I mean, I think, one of the things that I would just sort of sort of point out, I guess, is that there's sort of an underlying normative sort of claim here that to me is not entirely clear. Um, and I think this, this goes to Silvio's point and, and some of what Devon said earlier is, is what should be the outcome of cross-cutting exposure, right? Should it be more moderate views? Is that always a good thing, right? If we're exposed to people who are backlash against human rights, like should, should I moderate my views as somebody who believes in human rights? 
Um, this goes to, I think, some of the arguments we had yesterday about is polarization a bad thing versus, and I think it's a separate question than social cohesion, right? So negative partisanship is what scares the crap out of me, right? Like the idea that viewing, viewing somebody who, viewing like my daughter's future spouse, if they're a member of the opposite party, as being sort of an evil individual or a bad thing. However, if that spouse was polarized in views from me, like that's fine because sometimes we're just gonna have irreconcilable political values. Um, and sometimes we just need to fight that out institutionally or think about a long game of like, look, I'm, a, I'm on the left, I'm a progressive Democrat, I wanna win. I could care less about, like I I'm, believe strongly in gun control. I wanna figure out a way to fight that battle. And I think that's, we have to have a role for activism in here and for, for passion and, and political values and, and you know agonism without necessarily thinking that everything can kind of be dialogued away and create kind of a mushy middle. So I, I just wanna build on that so quickly because the G unit I just found, when you have Democrats who are exposed to heterogeneous communication, right, a cross cutting, yeah. in the course of the end of the 2016 election, they become less trusting of minorities, less trusting of other countries, less trusting. So normatively, yeah. you go, that's <laughs> terrible. But hey, that's cross-cutting talk. Yeah, wow, that's right. That's great. exactly they right. Learn from the that's other exactly side. right. And they're moderating their views. That's the question. Right? Yeah. This is very loaded with normative assumptions, right? And we'd love to see people who are don't agree with us move towards us. What happens when people we agree with move away from um, our views? Sherry, sure, looks like we have one point. more reaction. Do you want to jump into this? Well, I. You know, have a cursory um, familiarity with the psychology literature on this, and I'm guessing probably a bunch of you do do have a much deeper um, recognition of this. But there is an entire field focused on this incredibly important question, which is what what kinds of contexts get people to the psychologists like to talk about reasoning, right, and sort of logical thought. But really, it's about, OK, do I take this information, and do I reason through it, or does it reinforce my biases already? I mean, there's like a, a giant like whole field on this kind of thing, which, again, I only know enough about to know that it kind of exists. But you know, this kind of thing, again, there's a huge amount of possibilities for cross-fertilization here, because they look at this from the perspective of cognitive processes, right? How mm -hmm. do you get people to reason as opposed to you know, just kind of whatever? instinctually go with your motivated biases. Or like, maybe this fellow knows more about this literature than I do, but it's there, right? I mean, and so this is, if this is what you're trying to get at, which I think is really critical, like what are the contexts within which different kinds of information flows motivate people to whatever, mm -hmm. rethink, become more tolerant, whatever, then, I mean, you would, you should probably be talking to your fellows in the psychology department as well. Or even, it, it's a great point, point. even psychology within com, like Vincent Price yeah. and the yeah. argument yeah. repertoire folks. Motivated yeah. processing, right? Yeah. How do we yeah. discount yeah. the stuff? Even when we encounter disagreement, we just ignore it. Though. Yeah, it's a great point. Uh, Carl and then York. It seems like, so this is coming from a statistician, I'm shaking my head not okay. because I'm a psychologist, but just that it seems that what, what your point was, and I want to build on that, is that it's not so much about information and computation and acting rationally. Like that is not, at the end of the day, what we need. All of this communication is mediated by identity. And if people don't have some form of shared identity, then, then nothing is going to happen. And it, uh, and Talia's, this is actually a question in your uh, research yesterday that you presented, was did people know that they were watching MSNBC? Yeah. I mean, like, the, if you had played the same clip and it was labeled Fox News and it was like an old white guy that looked like one of the nightly anchors, my guess is that the, the outcomes could be very different. There's research on that yeah, that Joel, demonstrates yeah. exactly that. Yeah, yeah. Joel Turner has shown that it, if you see the same story on Fox or CNN or no source, mm -hmm. you're and bomb judgment of the, the bias. Yeah. 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 So all of this is mediated by like, is this person on my team? Mm -hmm. And if we don't have any notion of all being on this, excuse me, all being on the same team, uh, it, nothing is going to happen. And, and it's not about like acting rationally or something like that. It's about like just shared values and shared identity. We we'll go back to Deb in New York. Yeah. Do you think having, you know, this this kind of normative view is super important in, in, in really simple terms to just say, is, is there some uh, way we can agree on kind of basics of what 
what good looks like and what bad looks <laughs> like. When we when we uh, worked with Twitter behind the scenes on Jack Dorsey's announcement of um, committing Twitter to figuring out what healthy means. Yeah. Healthy is just a, 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 s a slightly more fancy way of saying good <laughs> versus bad, right? <laughs> and to say what, is, what does good look like? And in this context, um, this, ident this notion of shared identity, of course there has to be room for disagreement and to agree to disagree and all that. Um, but this is why I thought that fragmentation just seemed to me like a really uh, fundamental topic and a question of scale. That are we committed to one America? Because if you're not, then fragments are healthy. If you are, um, sustained, isolated fragments that are not coordinating, that are not even agreeing to disagree, they're actually just knocking in, into each other, and to use your language, one block solidifying and its goal becoming to eliminate the other block. Well, that sounds like bad if you're committed to a coherent unit. If you're, if you allow, you know, and if you are in uh, Catalan right now, you have a different point of view on what the right size of fragment is than mm. if you are in the rest, you know, in Spain. Um, and so I think this question of uh, just coherence as a whole, um, and then you don't have to, you know, because uh, I, I think a lot of the, uh, everyone here is pretty much in, in one political yeah. leaning, right? So mm -hmm. I, I think if, if we had Sykes in the room, what would be a definition um, mm -hmm. that we, we could c agree to as a group? In fact, I'm, I'm serving on a commission with Sykes, so I'm, uh, more tempted now to pull him in to uh, this conversation or sort of some variant of it because I think he'll engage uh, yeah. and it'll drive a different kind of uh, sort of consensus on what good looks like and healthy. That'd and there'll great. still be people I think who will disagree with that definition at, at some point to say what are our values and if someone disagrees with that there's actually a fundamental difference of values in terms of what a healthy democracy looks like. That right. If there isn't commitment to that whole or if your definition of democracy is a tent, but you to be able to pinpoint, hey, we have different definitions of who should be under the tent, as right. opposed to living your own lives under that tent, right? So I think there's some very basic uh, uh, grounding out of of that normative that it would be amazing if this group came out with something and could then engage the Sykes, uh, if not the diehard Trump supporters, yeah. some of whom may actually have a different view on what, um, you know, like, hey, let Texas, let, let us be free. And there's, I know, I have friends in California who, who, who secession yeah. is actually their goal. So, um, <laughs> fragmentate, you know, what's the size of the fragment, the scale at which uh, we're looking for uh, commons, uh, for truth, right? Um, there, there's something about scale. And yeah. do we have a commitment to a certain scale? Yeah. I, I, so I got thought with Twitter, is is Twitter's normative commitment to a single whole? Is that is that what's behind healthy for them? It's it's a great question. They're of course a global platform, and uh, our focus right now, and what we're going to do at Cortico and LSM, is America. Uh, they've just not stated, but okay. they, they're going to you know they're going to have to grapple. In fact, the yeah. first question was, hey Deb, you're Canadian. Uh, is there any reason you can't you guys can't do this for Canada and U.S. together? I'm like, yeah, actually. The last couple of years has been clarifying for me uh, on the deep cultural differences between Canada and the yeah. U.S. They came into contrast mm. suddenly mm. for me. So I, I would not try to build these indicators for to include Canada right now. And so I think we have to think about. Um, so anyways, that's that's uh, I, I can't speak on behalf of Twitter. I think. Sure. Um, uh, and, and, and by the way, we, <coughs> I've, I've been spending time with Facebook, um, and these same issues uh, are. Um, they're very interested in these. Uh, they'd be very interested in this discussion. And are we streaming right now? No, <laughs> no, no. We're, we're recording, right? We are recording. Okay. We're recording, but not streaming. When we're not recording, I'll, I can tell you more about Facebook. Okay. Cool. <laughs> yeah. We'll record. Live. Sounds good. <laughs> Your word. Yeah, I'd, uh, I'd like to um, um, add one comment and, and bring up an additional issue. I also think that in order to understand those questions, we need to dig deeper into the psychological theories uh, which are out there, help, help to understand, to explain the processes for why cross-cutting homogeneous communication should lead to those outcomes and I think one key uh, to this answering this question is motivated reasoning theory which clearly makes predictions about when do people react uh, with more polarization um, when being confronted in a, in a, in a cross-cutting environment or in a homogeneous environment both both can happen um, however when I look at your data I'm afraid that it would necessitate, necessitate, necessitate more data oh no you know? <laughs> anything <laughs> else no, not the sure slide. Yeah. show them the actual <laughs> well 
It's actually back here. Yeah. Um, this is pretty much what I've told you about, though. So this is talk radio data, political campaign data, so that's like strategic communications, advertising data from Wesleyan, um, TV news data, so broadcast <laughs> transcripts that Mike has been gathering. Um, this is Kathy's data. So this is the census data, demographic, economic data. I told you about Marquette poll. This is, uh, I've already told you about these elements. Yeah, sure. Uh, but but what, so what else do we need? Yeah, but <laughs> you know, in, or, yeah, in order to, to really <laughs> understand the conditions under which uh, an independent variable leads to a dependent variable, uh, you, you probably need also measures on, on, on psychological concepts, which mm. in most surveys, in most public opinion surveys, um, you know, are not present. Mm -hmm. uh, so that would probably require experimental work. Um, um, mm. Or alternatively, you, you simply take those uh, concepts as explanations for what you find, for the, for the relationships you find, but those will, ne will never be causal explanations in the sense that you can really be sure what, what has been happening. You can right. only post hoc describe that was probably the, the, the mechanism behind, uh, behind those things. And my second uh, thought is, uh, I think one of the great strengths we have in your data, and, and which you didn't highlight enough, I think, is the whole that dynamic nature. Mm -hmm. Because you, you uh, and we should also uh, discuss the concept of populism and related, related concepts um, on your slides um, more in a, in a diachronic, on, in, on a, with a diachronic perspective. Because when we talk about polarization and when you look into the literature, it always implies that we only look for polarization, we only look into one direction. Yep. But that is not the, I, I don't think this is makes, an, makes a fully sense because you can polarize and you can depolarize. Also, you can have elements of um, um, populist communication increasing or decreasing uh, during a campaign. Yes. And when we only look at aesthetic things and an aesthetic moment of time, <coughs> we'll never understand what is. Um, what's, what's, what's really going on, and you have a great opportunity to take a diachronic perspective, um, uh, and, uh, and not only looking for linear relationships, but also for nonlinear relationships, because yeah. this is actually what, given the complexity of, of the whole phenomenon that you just laid out, this is actually what is what is taking place. Yeah, you know, that's a great point. It's something I didn't mention when we were discussing the qualitative data was there was a sense amongst Republicans that when the occupation of the Capitol was happening, that they were losing. That popu popular opinion was on the side of the liberals in this case. And the, so then in that case, like the populist messaging would have failed. And then the story we've heard, what happened is then the protests spilled out of the Capitol. People went to Governor Walker's parents' house and protested at his dad's ministry and they protested his at his house. Yeah. And, and that, um, qualitatively is when opinion started to turn. We haven't gone in and made, but like, that wasn't populism, that was something else, like, right? And so like understanding yeah. when when the message was, what you said fits in with things I'm thinking. And, and Sykes, just, just to, Sykes played a very clear and, you know, understandable, I should say, role in publicizing those protests yeah. beyond the actual focus protest. It was like, look at, look at, look at this outrageous behavior. And Charlie played him. I think we don't know empirically, but we know qualitatively yeah. a role in in magnifying. Well, I think of it like the yeah. Swift Boat ads in 2004. They barely aired anywhere, but the coverage about them was intense, right? And like the protests at Walker's family's house didn't happen a lot, but the talk about right. it was constant. It was a zombie march yeah. with the Special Olympics. Uh, uh, the state capital too, if you remember that. Oh, yeah. A number of instances where the photo like op was so idiotic. So stupid. Like a, a level of what stupidity. What the left was doing in terms of how it was playing and how the right was able to really strategically capitalize on it in, in, in ways that really reinforced this anti elitist message. I'm just trying to go back to so mapping H4 to these sets of data. H4, yeah. Uh, just like, I'm imagining in a very granular okay. way, how would you know which parts of the Wisconsin population were exposed. Like, yeah. So one thing that was mentioned was tightening up the definition of cross-cutting. Yeah. But then how do you pinpoint? I'm, I'm just trying to, I, I don't see how you go from this data to that hypothesis. Like, how do you examine it? So like, who's exposed to TV news data? It flow, for example? Cross-cutting. Yeah, you would need individual level media exposure, right? So we have that in yeah, multiple and ways of the original data, and the gray actually specifies additional custom data collections. So to your point, I think to yours as well, I think our goal for those custom data collections would be a much richer set of measures to get at the question of cross-cutting, but also 
touch some experimental elements within that question wording to start to tease out under what conditions are people open to or opposed to hearing alternate perspectives. You know, so there's, there's, there's ways to start to tease that, but in this data right now, it would be longitudinal modeling. It'd be looking at the changes in the, at the macro level and seeing what that's doing to uh, uh, patterns uh, among, say, partisan subgroups, strong partisans, moderate partisans, independents, how are they reacting to the overall communication environment? Does, for example, among strong partisans, does talk radio explain public opinion change versus, say, mainstream media mm -hmm. coverage? That's but it's very aggregated. It's yeah. not that we have to, to get to the individual level, we need those additional data collections. Yeah. Or we have to focus on specific waves of the of Charles's data where there's questions about social talk, social media, news consumption, uh, 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 television news use, but even then, not specifically about cross cutting. Uh, Talia and then Sven. Yeah, I'm, I'm still thinking about the dependent variable, and I, I, I just try to, to integrate all, all the different voices I heard before. I think, what, what, is the, what, what are we looking at? And I think network heterogeneity is not enough, apparently. Cross-cutting exposure is not enough, because it can has, have also detrimental effects. Mm -hmm. So what, what are we really looking for? And I think maybe it's something like healthy cross-cutting communication, mm. because and not only exposure, as Silvio pointed out, exposure is probably not enough. Mm -hmm. Maybe there should be something like interaction. And, and I wonder if you could find out uh, cases when there was really something like cross-cutting, healthy communication in your data, when, when the two parties in your data, the two tribes or whatever, mm. when they communicated with each other in a civil, I don't know, productive way, mm. um, if that would be in there, I, I would find that really interesting to, to, to look for that and to tr trying to explain that, uh, when that happened and when that didn't take place. Would you be persuaded by the sense that we have two measures, one that we've written on, which is, I stopped talking to you because we disagreed politically. I stopped talking. The other was I tried to persuade someone to view uh, uh, about politics, right, or tried to pers persuade them to vote a certain way. So the question would be a typology, which is, if I try to persuade someone to vote and then I close that conversation, that's not good. Mm. But if I try to persuade them and I kept communication open, that would suggest that that's a more, I mean, that's not a perfect measure of what you're saying. No, but still, it's, it's pretty getting close. closer, yeah. right? Uh, there, is, there is some research on befriending on, on, on Facebook, yeah. which is basically yep. you accept, tolerate people who disagree with you. But the defending happens in situations of heightened conflict. Mm -hmm. When you go, when your wall gets filled with sort of you know views that you disagree that were latent but become active. Mm -hmm. So that's I mean it's different. You can be on the everyday basis exposed to people who, with whom you profoundly disagree. But was your you know best friend in I don't know, high school and you know, but in situations of conflict when you engage in more active kind of exposure to or dialogue, then it becomes different. It's just two steps. So cross-cutting communication is much more nuanced and complex, right? It's, it's not monotonic. I, I'm happy to experience some, but if it gets too intensive, then I cut it off. Right. But that might preserve cohesion. Exactly. And that's Sometimes exactly the Diana Lutz's argument. And we wrote about this in the piece, which yeah. is, when you close off talk, is it because I'm severing a relationship? Because I don't want to disagree with you because I have other relationships I want to maintain with you. Yep. Jerry? I thought I understood the research that you presented yesterday in precisely this vein, right, which is that when you have these kinds of conversations with coworkers, there's enough both iteration and trust that you can afford to disagree, right, without feeling like, okay, this is too tense, or I'm just going to walk away because it's like easy on Facebook to defriend themselves. So in some ways, the workplace is kind of a sort of, if I understood what you were saying, right, a kind of great place for that kind of communication to occur, right? Because, you know, you're colleagues, so you, you have a level of sort of trust there, and it's iterated. You can't just walk away. And so I understood you as getting at precisely this dynamic. Again, this is not my field, so I just want to make sure I'm understanding. That was the way I understood the research you were presenting yesterday, is kind of getting at some of, the, some of these questions of when do cross, when does cross-cutting information or interaction with people who you disagree with have the effect of making you not necessarily change your mind, but remain kind of open-minded and tolerant, as opposed to settings where being presented with people with different views, you know, makes you kind of, you know, what did you say, in insulate or insulate was the term? You Retrench. Re re inoculate. Re inoculate. Yeah. You're inoculated against, you know, being, 
receptive to that kind of communication. Am I, did I understand that correctly? Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, work by others like the NMS has done a lot of work demonstrating that the workplace is a uh, primary location for these cross-cutting conversations to take place and uh, that it can be more open because it's an acquaintance rather than right. a family member. So you react to those situations in different ways. And then um, intergroup contact theory also suggests that when you meet with someone on for some grounds other than politics and then learn about politics mm -hmm. over time, then you're more receptive to, you know, oh, well, this person wasn't half bad. So okay, so that's the, those are different contextual factors that might shape, again, the way you react to these different kinds of messages, yes, right? Yes. And again, just one other thing, again, for the American politics literature, my understanding was that the, that there were very strong findings that, you know, sort of the correct kind of door-to-door -door canvassing has a power, much more powerful impact on getting people to kind of, again, if not change their minds, be receptive to other views in a way different kinds of political campaigning doesn't, right? So you go and someone comes to your door and says, oh, can I talk to you for a few minutes about, you know, gay marriage, right? Yeah. It's an individual kind of contact, it's kind of low stress, and that, my understanding is, is relatively effective as far as, again, getting people to keep their minds open as far as hearing new kinds of views, right? So is that also the kind of, again, this kind of thing that you're trying to figure out, like what are the contextual variables that make people willing to, you know, be yeah, receptive, I think or open-minded, or however you, whatever the right terminology is. I, I think that's very well put. Yeah. Okay. In the case of door to door canvassing, what's the late? There was a debunked study or yeah. a yeah. falsified right, study. Right, but I think but they did. Yeah, the, the they read it. Was wrong, but the finding they turned out uh, to be robust, right? Yeah. 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 It was redone by what? So the debunkers yeah. and then the, uh, yeah, and then the out, results yeah. helped. The results helped. As okay. strong as it was before? No, it's a little more nuanced <laughs> than it was before, but it's well, basically the overall. conclusion. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but to, to answer your question, yeah, I think that's right. No, what what are the conditions that lead people to be a little more right. receptive to something? But what is the thing that they're receptive to, and what's the ultimate outcome of that? Are these are great questions that we're raising. And I think this relates to yeah. And I think this relates to kind of what Jorg was saying about like just the dynamic nature of our data. But then when Holly was talking about the intergroup contact theory, like we have, like our stop talking paper is. There are plenty of circumstances under which people are willing to put politics aside and talk, and that there are times when politics is so overwhelming yes. in daily life they are not, and we can show that dynamically with what we have. And some of the some worst, of some of the worst was people in certain kinds of workplaces. Right. That's right. So it's actually the workplace got flipped on its head when Walker was mobilizing these workplace-based resentments. Hmm. Um, workplaces are certainly a source of disagreement. That may also be a space where you end up closing off talk. Yeah, because at a certain point, that, that disagreement gets uncomfortable. So you expose the difference, but this goes back to the question that keeps coming up, which is how do we respond to cross-cutting talk? Some of us recoil. Some of us say, let's not talk about that. I want to maintain this relationship. Some of us go head to head, right? I mean, and, 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 but in any of those conditions, do we actually change our minds? And the That's um, part of this, right? There's no acceptance or change your mind, right? Or change your understanding, trying to understand right. it in perspective. I don't think there's that, yeah. right? There's or also uh, tolerance transformations, yeah. and to use your yeah. empathy mm -hmm. phrase of the communication ecology for workplaces. So we had a dramatic example recently with Google. If you remember yeah. James DeMori, yeah. who wrote from his point of view, he's a Harvard PhD. He wrote a, you know. I think like 13 page, you know, kind of academic piece around gender and, and software engineering skills and never expected it would end up on the front page of the New York Times. Mm -hmm. And then it got picked up, it went viral on Twitter, yeah. and then there's all of these feedback loops from outside of Google that put intense pressure yeah. on, on uh, the CEO and within 24 hours he fired yeah. um, uh, the engineer who's now suing Google right. and Google's own other, you know, there's engineers at Google who actually thought the the uh, essayists had had good points, and the, the speech was silenced. And of all places, Google engineers leaked their actual opinions to Breitbart, and then Breitbart morning afterwards. I mean, it's just kind of this crazy dynamic. The culture wars within Google now, and those rifts are. It's a great example. Uh, our the tech industry is pretty ripe with that in some respects too, like Gamergate and the whole question of, of course, yeah. gender equity. And that space is pretty appalling. Yeah. 
So thank you for all those thoughts. So it's it's 10 to noon. Maybe people would like to stretch legs. Yeah. <laughs> or, okay. Maybe we'll do the wrangling around the table. Yeah. yeah. Right. So we'll stretch legs and then head toward the table. So thanks so much. We're going to transcribe those notes. Yeah.